Oh, lucky Yuya. From a young age, he knew that the world wasn't exactly rolling out the red carpet for him. But despite being about as welcome as a fart in church, he still wanted to do a little good in his own pathetic way. So, one day, he's taking a casual stroll down a deserted street. Because where else would a loser like him be? And what does he stumble upon? Oh, just some local thugs harassing poor little Kaori. She's obviously not interested, but these brainiacs just won't take a hint. Yuya's heart starts racing as he watches the scene play out like a terrible B-movie, but he somehow musters up the courage to confront the three goons. He calls out to them like a scared little mouse, causing them to pause for a second and glare at him. Wow, what a hero. Of course, Yuya isn't exactly a chiseled Adonis. In fact, he's more likely to be mistaken for a beached whale. But hey, that doesn't stop him from trying to be a knight in shining armor for poor Kaori. As you might expect, the thugs start making fun of his looks, because why not kick a guy when he's down, right? Yuya stumbles over his own feet like a newborn giraffe and tells them they're bothering the girl. Well, that really sets the thugs off. They beat him up like a pinata, while poor Kaori watches in terror like a deer in headlights. How convenient that the police sirens scared off the thugs, saving Yuya's life and preventing him from being reincarnated with superpowers in another world. And look, a concerned citizen comes to check on him, but she quickly realizes he's not worth her time and leaves him to struggle on his own. Meanwhile, the cops and this damsel just stand there watching as Yuya stumbles away. Because who needs actual assistance when you can just gawk at someone's misfortune? But it's okay, because Yuya has his grandfather's words of wisdom to reflect on as he walks home. Because nothing says emotional support like a vague platitude from a family member. And of course, it's just Yuya's looks that are the problem here, not the fact that he's been relentlessly bullied and mistreated his entire life. His own parents won't even let him wear the same clothes as the rest of the family. Because heaven forbid they be associated with someone who isn't conventionally attractive. But it's all good, because middle school is where things really start to pick up. Yuya gets to experience the thrill of being thrown in the trash by his peers. Aw, the memories. But don't worry, Yuya's traumatic flashback ends when he finally makes it home. The loner gets to spend his time lying in a room with his dead grandfather's memorial. And how lucky he is to have had his grandfather's wise words to live by. Because we all know that vague platitudes are the answer to life's problems. But wait, it gets better. The day his grandfather died, Yuya inherited the house and all of his savings. But of course, his parents were quick to swoop in and try to take it away. Too bad for them. Because Yuya's grandfather was smart enough to put precautions in place to prevent that from happening. And so, Yuya was left to fend for himself, working part-time just to survive. What a wonderful family dynamic. But hey, at least Yuya has his middle school graduation ceremony to look forward to, right? Except no, because all the normal students are too busy interacting with each other and taking pictures to bother with him. Instead, Yuya gets to hide behind a building and read through his yearbook, filled with lovely comments about how undesirable and unwanted he is. After receiving some harsh words, this poor chap decides to make a run for it only to be greeted by some charming school bullies who are more than happy to remind him of his place as their personal punching bag. How delightful. He even tries to plead with them, citing his job as a paperboy, but they're not interested and decide to teach him a lesson for having the audacity to think he's something special. Oh, but it gets better. The other students gather around, enjoying the show and documenting the beating for posterity. And let's not forget about dear Yuya's brother and sister, watching from a distance and thoroughly amused by the whole affair. After what must have been an exhilarating experience, our protagonist is left with a ripped yearbook and a lovely black eye. But wait, there's more. He even gets scolded by his boss for being late, only to find out that his job had already been done by someone else. After that, Yuya spends the entire following day apologizing for the inconvenience of being beaten to a pulp by school bullies. After all that, he heads home for a feast of instant ramen, slurping away like a champ until he's done. But wait, there's drama. He stares at the broth for a while before heading to the bathroom to rinse his mouth, only to be confronted with his battered face in the mirror. And what does he do? Cry, of course. It's all too much for him, so he punches the mirror repeatedly and bleeds all over the place. But the fun doesn't stop there. He is convinced that nothing will ever change, so he takes matters into his own hands and punches the bathroom wall with his other hand. Lo and behold, a secret door opens and reveals a hidden room full of strange souvenirs from his globe-trotting grandfather. And what does Yuya find? A mysterious door, of course. He's so curious that he opens it and ends up in a cabin in another world. 
As if that wasn't enough, a menu pops up and startles poor Yuya. The menu tells him about an appraisal skill and other mysterious functions, including an option to cash out whatever that means. And just to make things even more interesting, the system informs him that he's the only one who can use the door to the other world. Yuya suddenly realizes that this whole thing is like a video game. How delightful. So, being the curious boy that he is, he checks his status and finds out that he's at level 1 for everything. How depressing. But wait, he has starter points that he can assign to his stats, so he's not a complete loser after all. And even better, he has an item box. But let's be honest, who cares about all that? Yuya just wants to see the fantasy world, so he rushes to the window like a kid in a candy store. And guess what? The scenery confirms that he's really in another world. But then he spots a piece of paper on the table, and it's written in some otherworldly language. What to do? No worries folks, the system gives him a skill that enables him to comprehend the text. And what does Yuya find out? That the owner of the house was a sage who passed away. And if someone finds the crib whatever that is, ownership of the house and everything inside will be transferred to them. But wait, Yuya just became the owner. How lucky can one boy get? And to top it all off, ownership is automatically renewed by magic. So, no one else can break in except for the owner. Yuya is really having a blast in his new fantasy world. He stumbles upon a pile of weapons and of course, can't resist inspecting them all. He finds a sword that's way more dangerous than he thought. But that's just perfect for him to defend himself with. So he takes a stroll outside and tries to practice with it. But oops, he slips and falls. But no worries, the system rewards his clumsiness with yet another skill. He's convinced he's some kind of prodigy. He even tries out all the other weapons in the pile and decides they're all super dangerous. He gains a skill for running around with a bunch of sharp objects, like that's some kind of accomplishment. Yuya then decides to pack up all the weapons into his item box because who knows when he might need them. And then out of nowhere, a bloody ogre appears and charges towards the house. But luckily, Yuya remembers he's the only one who can enter the barrier and keeps the ogre out. After peeing his pants a little, he uses his appraisal skill to check out the ogre's level and realizes he's in way over his head. The monster thinks throwing a tree will be effective, but of course, it fails miserably. So he decides to go for the classic spear throwing technique. Yuya is such a skilled warrior that he takes a stance and hurls the spear with incredible strength, obliterating the monster in just one shot. The system rewards him by leveling him up significantly, and he even notices a fancy glow over the fence. Turns out the bloody ogre had some loot, and it includes high-level armor. Yuya spends some time allocating his stats and decides to call it a day. As he heads home, the door activates the cash-out feature, dropping some real-world money into his lap. And to top it all off, he goes through a metamorphosis overnight because why not? Yuya is just that amazing. The next morning, Yuya wakes up feeling like he's been through a meat grinder. But hey, at least he's got the shredded muscles to match. His body is so chiseled, Michelangelo would be impressed. And the best part, he didn't even have to choke down bland chicken and broccoli to get there. As he struggles to squeeze into his clothes, he realizes that he feels different. It's not just his newfound muscles, something else has changed. But since he broke his mirror last week, he can't quite put his finger on it. Not that it matters, though. He still thinks he's as ugly as a troll's toenail. But little does he know, the system and all its perks have followed him into the real world. As he uses it to pick out his outfit for the day, he gives thanks to the wise sage who left some clothes behind. And it seems that his vision has improved too. He can see things more clearly than ever before. Yua even discovers that the sage was growing some vegetables, so he decides to take care of them. Using his appraisal skill, he's amazed by how healthy everything looks. It's like he's got his own little Garden of Eden going on. And when a monster approaches his house, Yuya doesn't even bat an eye. He's practically a superhero now, after all. Plus, who needs a security system when you can just flex your way out of danger? Yuya goes full on Rambo and pierces the monster with one shot from his spear. The loot drops and, to his surprise, there's coffee jelly. Yum. But that's not all, there's a rare item that he immediately equips, giving him a stab boost. With all this newfound power, he decides to buy a new uniform for his high school entrance ceremony. The tailor is warned that Yuya needs it before the ceremony, or else he'll have to go in his birthday suit. Days pass by, and Yuya spends his time enjoying his other world home cooking up a storm with his fresh veggies. What was once a way to escape depression has now become an obsession. Yuya trains and trains, trying to become the strongest warrior in the land. But despite his skills, he knows deep down that his problems at school won't magically disappear. One day, while doing his usual checks, Yuya is ambushed by an elite goblin. 
but this is no match for Yuya. He dodges and counters with ease, finishing off the goblin with a well-placed spear thrust. But, to his surprise, he doesn't level up this time. Yuya realizes that no matter how strong he gets, he'll still have to face the horrors of high school. The next day, Yuya walks into school, completely unaware of his new ripped bod. The girls all swoon as he passes by. Even his siblings are starstruck from a distance. Yuya checks his class schedule and heads to his first class, but as soon as he sits down, his bullies corner him. Yuya freezes in fear, but to his surprise, the bullies ask him if he's a transfer student. Yuya replies that he is the same old Yuya Tenjo. The whole class and even Yuya's siblings are shocked and are in disbelief. Yuya then goes to the bathroom to check what's wrong, and he is pissed that he is still not that handsome. After the class, the students group up to know more about Yuya and suddenly a car arrives. The same girl Kaori appears and surprisingly knows Yuya even in this new avatar. She calls out Yuya's name cause she figured out he was the one who saved her from those thugs at the convenience store. Yuya's mind is blown when he remembers the whole thing, but he's confused how Kaori knows his name. Turns out, she wanted to thank him so she had him investigated. She admits it was rude, but then she straight up asks him to come to UCI Academy which totally catches him off guard. Yuya's little brother recognized her school uniform and mentioned it to her, which added to Yuya's confusion since it's an extremely prestigious school. Kaori apologized for not introducing herself earlier and revealed that she's a student council officer there. Her friend added that her dad is the chairman of the school board, and when he heard that Yuya saved his daughter from some thugs, he offered him a spot at the academy. However, Yuya feels that he didn't really save her since he got beat up, and although he's grateful for the opportunity, he has to decline because his academic abilities aren't up to par. Then his siblings interrupt and ask if they can enroll instead of him, boasting about their superior academic and athletic abilities. But Kaori declines their offer and states that she's indebted to Yuya and wouldn't want anyone who insults him to attend the academy. Kaori admits to being aware of their daily malicious actions towards him after conducting a thorough investigation. The siblings fall to the ground in despair, realizing their chances of attending the prestigious school are now impossible. Kaori redirects the conversation to Yuya, explaining that the school values a strong character over academic ability, so his enrollment wouldn't be an issue. Her assistant suggests showing him around the academy, but Yuya is hesitant because he's already attending another school. However, Kaori assures him that his principal will be notified of his absence. With that settled, she eagerly takes his hand and leads him to the car. Meanwhile, the siblings and bullies vow to seek revenge. Upon arrival at the upscale school, Yuya is amazed that even someone like him has heard of it. It's known for producing successful students who excel in various fields, and acceptance guarantees future success. It's a world he's never experienced before. They make their way to the office of the chairman, who offers him some tea while thanking him for coming. After introducing himself, the chairman expresses his gratitude for the protagonist's heroic act of saving his daughter. However, the protagonist seems bashful and doesn't want to accept any praise, claiming that what he did wasn't that impressive. Kaori argues that everyone else was hesitant to help, but the protagonist was the only one who took action on behalf of the chairman's daughter. The chairman adds that the protagonist should be proud of his actions, as they demonstrate his admirable character, which is highly valued at the school. Kaori's father then gets to the point and expresses his desire for the protagonist to attend the school, seeing it as a reward for his bravery. He also mentions that the protagonist won't have to pay tuition fees. However, Yuya interjects by stating that the school is only for geniuses. The chairman explains that a genius is someone who finds the most efficient way to complete a task compared to others. He adds that, aside from that, geniuses are the same as everyone else. Kaori's father believes that everyone has their unique talents that the school can identify and nurture by challenging them in different ways. Therefore, there is no need for the protagonist to be self-deprecating. He just needs to take his time and find his path. The chairman's wise words remind the protagonist of his grandfather. Finally, the chairman suggests that the protagonist spend the rest of the day on a trial enrollment before giving his answer regarding attending the school. Masawada arrives, and the chairman introduces her as a renowned scientist whose teaching style is adored by the students due to its simplicity. Yea is asked to attend one of her classes, with everything already arranged. He decides to take up the offer and spends the day waiting just outside the class, anxious about how the other students will receive him. During the pre-introduction, his apprehensions are fueled by his past horrible experiences. The teacher encourages him to come in, 
but he hesitates before finally stepping forward to give his formal introduction to the class. The students stare at him for a moment, which makes him feel self-conscious. However, a female student breaks the silence by commenting on how insanely handsome he is, leaving all the girls in shock and captivated by his presence. The number one pretty boy even acknowledges him as a formidable rival. The teacher brings them back to the present moment and instructs him to sit by the window at the back of the classroom. As the lesson commences, the teacher pleads with Hayru to share her book with him, and they join their tables. After their first interaction, Yuya feels like he messed up and that the she hates him. But that is far from the truth, as his new looks will get any girl to reign. As the lesson continues, he realizes that it isn't much different from the classes he was used to attending. The primary contrast lies in the fact that the students in this school are more proactive and seem to be enjoying themselves, which is a novel experience for him. Following the class, a few students approached him to learn more about the new student. Ryo mentioned that they were overwhelming him and they apologized as they left. He introduced himself and invited Yuya to the cafeteria for some food. The new student was astonished at the variety and quality of the food, and even more taken aback by how affordable it was. Ryo suggested that if he was spoiled for choice, the daily special was a safe pick and it was free. Yuya felt as though he was in paradise based on what he was seeing. After they obtained their food and sought a place to sit, Shindo waved them over. As they sat down, Yuya realized that they shared an interest in anime and video games. He noticed that everyone in the cafeteria was staring at him and concluded that it was due to his different uniform. Following a few more lessons at the school, the day came to an end, and he made his way back to the chairman's office for a debrief. Yuya found the school incredible and expressed a desire to attend if they would accept him. He demonstrated his respect for the chairman as he made the declaration. After the meeting, Kaori waits outside, eager to hear the verdict. She's relieved when he says he wants to attend and asks if he's free to hang out. The two head to some fancy shops that students usually visit after school. Yuya asks if she usually comes here with her friends, but Kaori confesses that she doesn't really hang out with people. She explains that it's because of her family's status and her father's work, which makes people hesitant to approach her. However, she's happy to be with him and enjoy their time together. Yuya gets a bit nervous from her words, so he changes the topic and suggests they try a new crepe store. They both get different flavors and sit down to eat while other students steal glances at them. They have a good time and laugh together. Yuya is curious about how she recognized him after his transformation, and Kaori tells him that his eyes remain the same and she recognized him from his honest and kind eyes. Yuya gets a bit shy and starts to blush, addressing her formally, which annoys Kaori a little as she thought they had become quite friendly. She encourages him to call her by her first name to commemorate their friendship. They take a bite of each other's crepes, which makes them both a little bashful. The girls around them watch the cute moment and make comments about it. After his little date with Kaori, Yuya returned home and donned his new armor, preparing to venture into the fantasy world. He was uncertain about how busy he would be once the enrollment procedures were complete, so he wanted to spend some time leveling up, just in case he didn't get the opportunity later on. Stepping through the gate and into the world, Yuya was immediately confronted with a monster that was violently attempting to breach the barrier. Although he still got afraid when he had to face monsters, Yuya overcame his fear once again and landed a swift attack that vanquished the creature. He then dropped the loot he had obtained into his item box and opened his stats menu to check his level, which was 235. Yuga realized that he was leveling up more slowly now and understood that he would not improve if he remained confined to his house. Looking out into the deep forest, Yuya was confident that there were powerful monsters beyond the fence. He thought about how things had turned around for him in his world before opening the gate and stepping forward. All daydreaming, Yuya's concentration is broken by a scream of pain. He quickly takes out his spear and dashes into the forest to see what's going on. Upon arrival, Yuya discovers corpses scattered all around the area, and a level 200 goblin general just ahead of him. To his surprise, he also finds a human lady hiding in fear. Yuya rushes towards the general and launches his spirit, but the creature easily deflects it, leaving it open for a drop kick to the face that knocks it back. The girl informs Yuya of an incoming attack from behind, which he dodges, and after a few exchanges, he takes the attacker down with a sword slice. Yuya rushes over to the lady to check if she's okay, but she falls unconscious. He wonders who she is, and soon after, a voice calls the name Lexia as it approaches. Yuya uses his invisible skill to disappear just as they arrive. He watches the unit rush over to the lady, checking for signs of life, and is relieved to see that she is breathing. As the story continues, Yuya thinks about the encounter and wonders if the girl is okay. However, since knights appeared to help her, 
He assumes that she must be fine. Looking down at his shirt, which is enchanted to stay clean, he decides to use the money he has earned in the other world to buy some new clothes. As he walks around, people stare at him, thinking he must be some kind of actor or model. Meanwhile, we see a director yelling at another man, who is the manager for a model named Sho. Sho has failed to show up for their shoots, causing frustration and anger. The manager received a call from Sho, who informed him that he was on his way. However, the director was infuriated because Sho was not respecting everyone's time, and the crew was all set for the photo shoot. Myo, their other model, had been waiting all morning for the shoot, which was focused on being a couple, so it was impossible to proceed without Sho. The director contemplated what to do, and since everyone was waiting to start, he decided to search for a replacement within the mall. As Yu Yao wandered around the mall, he was overwhelmed by the numerous options available. Some girls approached him, and he was worried that it was a sales tactic. They asked to know more about him, and even offered to assist him with shopping, but he politely turned them down, just like a Sigma would do. The girls were taken aback and started freaking out over him, but Yu Yao wondered if he had handled the situation appropriately. Meanwhile, the director struggled to find a replacement, but refused to give up. As he was walking, he passed by Yu Yao and instantly thought he was the one. The director approached Yu Yao and explained their predicament to him. Despite feeling nervous, Yu Yao ultimately agreed to be the model for the shoot after considering how many people were depending on him. He played the role of a boyfriend and posed in various outfits and positions. While the director instructed him to look sexier, Yu Yao found it challenging to follow the direction. However, Myo encouraged him, saying he was doing well for his first time, and Yu Yao found himself captivated by her appearance. Myo thanked him for saving the day, but Yu Yao noticed that she was getting closer to him. The director observed that Yu Yao appeared stiff during the shoot, so they moved to another location. Yu Yao was impressed by how professional Myo was, despite being around the same age as him. He was determined to give his best effort. However, Myo grabbed onto him for the next shot, causing him to panic as she pressed up against him. The director instructed her to get even closer, so she wrapped her arms around him and pressed up even tighter, further embarrassing Yu Yao. The onlookers began to watch them as they continued the shoot. Meanwhile, in another world, Princess Lexia is contemplating her recent rescue and decides to venture out at night to search for the person who saved her. Despite her night's warning that it's unlikely someone lives in the dangerous dark forest, Lexia insists she must express her gratitude to the savior. The night questions where she inherited such reckless behavior from. Back to this world, as the shoot wraps up, Yu Ya is left exhausted. Myo thanks him, and when he chokes on his drink, she offers her handkerchief. Yu Ya is hesitant to use it due to his sweat, but also can't use his sleeve since the clothes are not his. He reflects on his first experience modeling and admires Myo's skill, but she admits to making many mistakes when she was still male. This is the first time Yu Ya has worn such fashionable clothing as he never had the chance in the past. During a conversation, he asks her why she started modeling. She explains that she had always wanted to be noticed, as her parents were always too busy to spend time with her. After she gained some fans, she continued modeling because she enjoyed the support of her followers and the ability to bring happiness to those who saw her. She encourages him to try modeling at his own pace and reminds him to enjoy every moment along the way. As they chat, the director takes candid photos of them, but suddenly, Sho appears, and the crowd becomes excited. He approaches Myo and pushes her against the wall, wanting to ask her out for drinks. However, Yu Ya notices that she is uncomfortable and interrupts them. Sho becomes aggressive and tries to punch Yu Ya, but Yu Ya throws him away. The sudden appearance of Sho and his attempt to ask Myo out for drinks catches everyone off guard. Yu Ya's swift reaction surprises him as he throws Sho away effortlessly. Yu Ya worries about causing a scene and getting into trouble for beating up such a good-looking guy, but the crowd cheers for him, considering him cool. Meanwhile, Sho wonders how he lost the fight despite being a boxer. The director intervenes and tells Sho to leave since they caught everything on camera in 4K. Sho runs away from the scene. Myo thanks Yuya for his help and admits that Sho has been following her around, and she didn't know what to do about it. The director informs them that Sho's behavior has always been unacceptable, and with this incident, he is unlikely to work again in the industry. He asks Yu Ya if he's interested in pursuing modeling further, to which Yu Ya expresses gratitude for the opportunity to work with professionals. However, he feels that he isn't good enough to do the job properly and declines the offer. The director respects his decision 
and instead offers him all the clothes from the shoot as a token of their appreciation, as they were unable to pay him as an amateur. Yuya believes that the experience was enough, but the director insists that it's only natural to be compensated for work, especially since Yuya saved them from a potential problem with Sho. Yuya ultimately accepts the gesture, and Myo expresses hope for working with him again in the future. As they leave in the car, they wish him good luck. The director laments that it's a shame that Yuya didn't want to continue modeling, knowing that he had the potential to be a star. Looking back at the photos, they are reminded of the great work that Yuya did during the shoot. As Myo reflects on how different Yuya is from the other models, the director notices her blushing and teases her about having a crush on him. Yuya packs up all of his new clothes, and we see that his photo has been circulating among agencies, with a woman desperately trying to sign him before anyone else can. She recognizes his potential even as an amateur, and is determined to not let him slip away. Meanwhile, in another world, we see Lexia's knights fighting against goblins, struggling to fend them off. Suddenly, a goblin appears behind Lexia, but is quickly defeated as Yuya arrives on the scene. The knights are shocked to see him, but Yuya easily takes care of the remaining goblins. Lexia is relieved to see that he is real and Yuya helps treat one of the wounded knights. As they catch their breath, Lexia reveals that she came to the dark forest because she has something important to tell him. Yuya is curious, but before he can ask, she shocks everyone by asking him to marry her. And that's where the episode ends, leaving viewers on a cliffhanger. In the episode, Lexia suddenly proposes to Yuya, leaving him confused and prompting Owen to question if the princess is in her right mind. Despite saving her, they don't know much about him. Lexia stubbornly insists that it was love at first sight and challenges anyone who has a problem with it. Owen recoils a bit when he realizes she's upset and she begins to criticize him for always nagging and telling her what to do. Yuya intervenes, offering to host them at his house to avoid being bait for monsters in the forest. They are surprised to find Yuya has a home in the forest. Owen is surprised to see a residence within the darkest region. Yuya serves them tea, and Owen formally introduces himself, followed by Lexia, who introduces herself with elegance. She thanks Yuya again for saving them, and reveals that she's a princess, and second in line for the throne. Yuya worries that speaking to her so casually could get him in trouble. So, Owen tells Yuya that it's not a big deal that they showed up unannounced because he saved their lives. Yuya introduces himself, but the group hasn't heard of him before. The princess then pulls Owen aside and speculates that Yuya must be a noble from another country. But Owen thinks he could be a wandering mage who's just exploring the world and doing research. However, the princess is convinced that Yuya is royalty and gets excited about the possibility of a royal wedding. Meanwhile, Owen wonders if Yuya could be a spy, but he quickly dismisses that theory. Lexia wanted to thank him for saving her life, but she passed out and missed her chance. She confesses that her heart has been beating for him ever since the rescue, and Owen cringes in the background as he backs up against the bookshelf. To make matters worse, Lexia proposes to Yuya again. Yuya is overwhelmed by everything and thinks marriage is a bit too sudden. Lexia is an enthusiastic reader of romance novels, which have taught her that love cannot be taken for granted. She is willing to overcome any obstacles in order to pursue her desires, so she suggests to her love interest that they start as friends. However, when he hears these words, he is reminded of all the rejections he has faced in the past. He gazes at Lexia's eager expression and blushes before agreeing to the arrangement, which they seal with a gentle handshake. Before things can progress further, Owen interjects, clearing his throat and announcing that the handshake has successfully conveyed Lexia's gratitude to her rescuer. Owen then requests that Yuya escort them back to their carriage, and as they depart, Lexia promises to win her love interest's heart the next time they meet. Although he waves back, he is slightly concerned by her words. Shortly thereafter, Owen returns with a message from the king who wishes to express his gratitude to Yuya in person. The monarch invites Yuya to the palace for an audience, but Yuya is nervous and finds the sudden turn of events overwhelming. Despite his initial hesitation, Owen reminds Yuya that it is a royal command that must be fulfilled and Yuya ultimately agrees to attend the audience at the palace. The captain takes into account the length of the journey and informs Yuya that they will need his presence for five days. Yuya realizes that in his world, it is golden week, and he asks them to wait a little longer. 
Owen understands and tells him that they are willing to wait until he decides on a date, given that they are the ones making the unreasonable demands. Meanwhile, in the outskirts of the capital, a masked man smashes his glass in frustration upon learning that his operation has failed. His subordinate admits that he has no excuses the assassins he sent were able to separate Lexia from her knights as planned, but things went awry when they ventured into the darkest regions and were wiped out by the monsters. The masked man demands to know why Lexia is still alive, but his subordinate has yet to find out that information. The boss gives him a piercing look before dismissing him, warning him that he is only getting one more chance. The subordinate addresses him as his highness and expresses his understanding before hurrying out, clearly frightened. The masked man, now alone, drops his face covering and stares at the ceiling, vowing to never forget what Lexia has done to him and promising that she will not escape his revenge. Yuya had marked the day he was supposed to meet the king on his calendar in a normal world. It was also his first day as an official student of UCI Academy. He put on his uniform and headed to school. On his way, he noticed that even the ladies from different schools admired him, and even the salary men were flushed by his presence. Yuya wasn't used to the attention, so he kept his head down. Upon arriving at the school, the chairman welcomed him briefly and left for an urgent meeting. Yuya's teacher reintroduced him to the class as an official student, and his friends Rai and Shingo waved at him. During their PE class, the students played soccer, and the girls from the tennis class cheered them on. Rai showed his skills on the field, leaving the opposition helpless as he danced past them and scored a goal. Yuya watched in amazement while Ki Kazama approached him and wondered why he wasn't participating. Yuya explained that he didn't have his P uniform yet, and they continued to watch the match. When Akira took a shot at the goal, it went off target and headed straight towards Keed, who braced herself for impact. But suddenly, Yuya overhead kicked the ball from an impossible position, and it went straight into the net. Everyone was stunned, including Ryu, who was confused by the incredible move he had just witnessed. Even prime Cristiano Ronaldo would have been impressed by Yuya's skill. Yuya's landing is perfect, and he heads over to Key to make sure she's okay. At this point, she has fallen for him, and Akira rushes over quickly to apologize and even offers to serve Key for the rest of his life. Key assures him that she's fine, and Raya vouches for Akira's good intentions, introducing himself to Yuya and thanking him for saving him from a lot of trouble. Later on, the girls get changed, and they discuss Yuya's impressive feat, which made them fall for him even more. Kaori walks in on their conversation about Yuya, and the other girls are sure that someone like him has to have a girlfriend. They even wonder how she would look like. At this point, Yuya is the god of Riznus. Both Kaori and Ki get jealous at the thought and make the same comments simultaneously. While Yuya's class goes back to the indoor lesson, Kaori's class has their PE session. The newcomer sits by the window and spots Kaori outside and they wave to each other. Suddenly, the school's main gate is knocked down by some hooligans on motorbikes. The hooligans make their way straight to the girls and surround them, intimidating the poor females with their weapons. Yuya's teacher declared a period of self-study and cautioned the students not to leave the classroom. Suddenly, a group of thugs appeared, but the teachers intervened and ordered them to seize their actions. One of the students recognized the group as the infamous Red Ogres, known to be the most dangerous delinquents in the area. However, the students were perplexed by their presence. Yuya remembered that the gang was previously led by a bully named Rocky, whom he used to know. Yuya looked down and saw Rocky, as well as his younger siblings, who were also present. Kaori stood up to the gang, demanding to know their business at the school. Unfortunately, the chairman was not present to deal with the situation. The gang asked Yuya's siblings if she was their target, and they confirmed it, revealing that they were seeking revenge because she allowed their older brother to attend the school while looking down on them. Kaori informed them that the police would soon arrive to stop their madness, but the siblings were confident that they could cause damage before then. The gang leader realized that law enforcement would be problematic for them and decided to go ahead with their plan to abduct their target. Yuya's younger brother also wanted to see his older brother suffer, just as the gang prepared to take Kaori. Yuya quickly stood up and headed for the door, but to his surprise, his feet were rooted in place, trembling with fear. He couldn't comprehend what was happening, as he had fought more dangerous opponents in the other world. Despite his body growing stronger, he felt that his heart was still weak. His negative thoughts made his head spin, but he took control and snapped himself back into focus. 
As his classmates watched in confusion, he declared that he would help and walk towards the window. Raya pointed out that the door was in the opposite direction, and the class began to panic as Yuya opened the window and leaped from the fourth floor. He landed flawlessly, catching everyone's attention, and immediately dashed to save the chairman's daughter. However, Araki stood in his way and stated that Yuya had become cocky since transferring to a fancy school and must be punished. Some of Araki's colleagues attacked Yuya, but he effortlessly dodged and disarmed them before proceeding forward. Araki himself blocked his way and attacked, but Yuya dashed past him as they were almost done with the kidnapping. As Yuya got closer to the gang, a big guy took a sumo stance and charged towards him, but Yuya stopped him with one hand and hurled him into a parked bike like a discarded lettuce. Witnessing their tank being handled like a toy variant, the gang backed off from Kawari. Yuya walked over to make sure she was unharmed, and the gang's leader, who had been observing the entire time, decided to get involved by attacking with his bike. Yuya displays his agility and finesse, dodging the bandit leader's strikes and ultimately defeating him like a South Indian hero. This delay proves to be crucial as it allows the police to arrive at the school and apprehend the attackers, including Yuya's siblings. While Kaori is on the verge of collapse from exhaustion, Yuya catches her and they share a moment. However, his younger brother starts criticizing the police for their lack of action, which angers the bandit leader, causing him to tightly grip the boy's neck and blame him for their failed plan. The sister pleads for him to let go, but he kicks her away, leaving the police helpless. Yuya steps in and asks the leader to release his brother. He separates them, ensuring the boy's safety. The bandit boss charges at Yuya, but his intimidating glare crushes his fighting spirit, causing him to submit to Yuya's dominance. Yuya's siblings are bewildered by his act of kindness despite their past mistreatment of him. Yuya explains that he can't abandon his family, and his words resonate with them, causing them to cry and beg for his forgiveness. As everything settles down, Yuya's friends and classmates rush over to him, commending his heroic actions. Meanwhile, Kaori departs with the other girls, impressed by Yuya. The episode kicks off with Yuya, eager to venture into the other world. However, he's reminded of Owen's warning about the dangers lurking in the forest, known as the Demon's Territory, and the most perilous place in the super dangerous zone. The monsters that Yuya had defeated with ease were no joke. They were capable of destroying an entire town if they were to appear in a group. Despite his initial curiosity, Yuya found nothing out of the ordinary in the depths of the forest, leading him to contemplate Sage's whereabouts. Suddenly, he hears a distressing scream and employs his invisibility magic to investigate. To his horror, he witnesses an ogre attacking a baby Finner. Yuya's level is too low compared to the ogres, making it impossible for him to defend the Finner. But when he hears its cries after the brutal attack, he can't help but intervene. Armed with his spear, Yuya charges at the ogre, ready for an epic battle. However, to his surprise, the ogre turns out to be a softy and falls quickly. Yuya then offers a healing drink to the baby Finner, but it's so terrified that it collapses. Yuya uses his healing magic to revive the little creature, and from that moment on, the two become inseparable. Yuya asks the Fenrir if it's lost or without parents, and the little creature responds as if it understands everything he's saying. Yuya names it Night due to its dark-colored fur and invites it to his house, to which it eagerly agrees. The adventure continued for Yuya and Night, as they stumbled upon a treasure that held a special item a hairbrush belonging to the Pig King. Yuya couldn't resist using it to brush Knight's fur, admiring how soft and fluffy it looked. He then eagerly checked his stats, hoping to see a significant increase after taking down the powerful ogre. But to his dismay, he was still at level 235. As they transported back to the real world, Yuya knew he had to show Knight some love and care. He asked his friends for a pet store recommendation, and Keed's excitement bubbled over as she asked for photos of Knight. Yuya's lack of a phone caught them all by surprise, and Ryo came to the rescue, revealing the pet store's location near their school. Shingo even mentioned an animal hospital nearby in case Knight needed any medical attention. Yuya invited his friends to join him, but they were all occupied with their own activities. Keed, however, couldn't resist the idea of helping Yuya with his new pet and eagerly offered her assistance, her excitement bordering on a first-aid vibe. The sun was setting, 
and Yuya decided to take his new companion, Knight, out for a walk. He had bought him some toys and a collar earlier in the day, and he was excited to see how Knight would react to them. As they walked, Yuya noticed that many people were staring at him and his pet. He felt a bit self-conscious at first, but then realized that Knight was drawing attention because of how cute he was. As they continued walking, an elderly man greeted Yuya, which surprised him. He had never received such a warm greeting from a stranger before. Yuya then ran into Kaori, a beautiful girl he had a crush on. He introduced her to Knight, and she couldn't resist petting him. People around them commented on how amazing they looked together. Just as things were starting to get cozy, Myo, a famous model, called out to Yuya from behind. Yuya was surprised to see her there, and she explained that she lived in the neighborhood and often went for walks at that hour. Kaori recognized Myo and was excited to meet her. Yuya introduced them, and people around them were mesmerized by the scene. As Myo bid her farewell, Yuya couldn't help but ask her to meet up again soon. However, his innocent gesture triggered a fiery response from Kaori, who couldn't contain her jealousy and interrogated him about his relationship with Mio. Yuya reassured her that it was just a casual encounter, but Kaori's anger continued to simmer as she watched Yuya interact with Mio. Just then, chaos ensued as a thief snatched an old lady's purse and made a run for it. Yuya, quick on his feet, instructed his loyal companion Knight to chase after the culprit. As Knight sprinted off, Yuya grabbed Kaori's hand and rushed to help the distressed victim. Knight soon returned with the thief in tow, but things took a dangerous turn as the thief pulled out a knife and charged towards Kaori. Without hesitation, Yuya sprang into action, using his impressive strength and agility to swiftly disarm the thief and take him down. The stunned onlookers gawked in amazement at the unexpected spectacle. Despite the chaos, Yuya remained calm and collected, proving himself to be a true Jigachad in every sense of the word. After an epic adventure, Yuya retreated to his favorite spot, the forest, to conquer it once and for all. With Knight by his side, they embarked on a mission to slay as many monsters as possible and gather all the treasure they could carry. As they progressed deeper into the woods, they came across a creature unlike any they had encountered before, a deer-like monster with two magical horns. Yuya was thrilled at the challenge and decided to take it down, but not before checking its stats, they were higher than those of an orc monster. Thinking fast, Yuya attempted to make himself invisible, but the monster had a sixth sense and began to advance towards them. Yuya took his battle stance and instructed Knight to distract the beast while he attacked from behind. But the monster was formidable, firing both fire and ice magic from its horns. With Knight's help, Yuya was able to land the final blow, and they eagerly began to collect their loot. Among the spoils was a futuristic bath cube that could generate a tub anywhere, anytime. Yuya couldn't resist trying it out and pressed a few buttons, causing a bathtub to appear out of thin air. The duo basked in the luxury of a peaceful soak after a long day's work. But their rest was short-lived, as they soon encountered an armadillo-like creature with iron spikes that spun like a bay blade and launched an attack on Yuya. Yuya had managed to thwart the monster's attack, but not without receiving a cut on his soft cheeks. Knight was concerned for his friend, but Yuya brushed it off as nothing serious. Then, a clever idea struck Yuya, he lured the beast into attacking him again, hoping it would get stuck in the rock behind him if he dodged. And lo and behold, his prediction was spot on. The monster was trapped making it an easy target for Yuya to dispatch. The intense battle left Yuya feeling drained, prompting him to check his stats. Though he was pleased to see his stats were slowly increasing, he couldn't help but feel impatient for more progress. Knight was in the same boat, but their attention was soon diverted when the rock behind them suddenly crumbled, revealing a hidden dungeon. Eager to explore, Yuya used his radar to detect any lurking dangers. To their surprise, the dungeon was already outfitted with fire torches, suggesting that someone had been there before them. As they ventured deeper, they stumbled upon a cryptic ritual site that sent shivers down Yuya's spine. And then, a ghastly discovery, a corpse clutching a book. As Yuya pried open the book, he realized its contents were far more sinister than he could have imagined. Meanwhile, an ominous hooded figure struck a deal with a masked girl, 
instructing her to hunt down a target at any cost, bringing the episode to an end. The episode begins with Yuya repeating the name of a book, which he links to the sage who used to own the house he is currently residing in. As he starts to read the book, his suspicions are confirmed as the sage reveals that he had mastered everything in the world to a high level, ranging from magic and martial arts to cooking and singing. As a result, he entered the realm of the gods while he was still alive and was even offered to join the deities, but he declined their invitation. The sage's writing address is Yuya, commenting that the strength he possesses is even more powerful than he knows, and as a consequence, a day will come when the people around him will start to be frightened by that same strength. The sage doesn't want Yuya to take the same path and have a miserable ending like he did. Yuya thinks aloud, wondering how he's supposed to prevent the people around him from becoming fearful of him. The sage's voice can be heard as he answers that Yuya should build human relationships, emphasizing trust. This startles him as he thinks he's hearing things. As he continues reading the book, it explains that this relationship can be between friends, lovers, or parents people who will stay by his side even when everything about him is exposed. Yuya confesses that he is someone who didn't have friends until very recently, so finding such people is a daunting task. Yuya accepted that he might be conversing with his spirit as the sage advised him to seek his allies and offered to share his knowledge on one topic. Yuya expressed his interest in magic, causing the book to briefly glow. The sage revealed that he had filled the book with his knowledge of magical theory, but explained that Yuya, being from a different world, lacked the necessary magical pathways to use it. Humans in the fantasy world produce magical energy in their hearts, which then circulates through their bodies via their blood vessels. To ensure that Yuya could use magic, the sage decided to bestow his magical pathways upon him. The sage considered his pathways valuable and did not want them to go to waste. He only wished for Yuya to have a fulfilling life once he became accustomed to the power. The book then glowed brightly, and characters flew off the page and pierced Yuya's chest. Knight rushed over to check on him, confirming that the pathways had been transferred. The sage ended by wishing Yuya a happy life filled with good fortune. Yuya thanked the sage for everything, hoping to finally find peace as he paid his last respects to the sage's corpse. After returning to the house, Yuya dives into the magical books to understand the principles of magic. He immerses himself in the teachings and begins to practice the techniques with Fenrir. Together, they focus and close their eyes to sense magical energy. Yuya quickly feels the magic pulsing through his body in rhythm with his heartbeat. Knight also senses the magical energy and joins in with the practice. As Yuya continues to read and learn from the book, he discovers a technique for magic manipulation that unlocks for him. The book instructs him to gather magical energy in the palm of his hands and visualize the desired magic he wishes to invoke. This technique does not require any incantations, which baffles Yuya. He decides to try it out and goes outside. Yuya raises his hand and starts the process, focusing on his intention to enchant a water ball. To his surprise, it works. Knight also manages to enchant a water ball on his first try. They both marvel at their newfound abilities and praise each other on a job well done. As Yuya and Knight test their abilities, they shoot their enchanted water balls at a nearby tree. However, they end up destroying more trees than intended. Yuya is astonished by the sheer power of his magic and realizes he still has much to learn. Meanwhile, Owen reports back to the king about his latest trip to the darkest region. He delivers his report but accidentally reveals Lexia's proposal to Yuya. The king, infuriated by the news, signals for his sword and destroys the statues in his throne room. He accuses the unknown stranger of seducing his princess and demands to know the truth from Owen. Owen regrets his mistake and hides in a safe place, worried about the consequences of his slip-up. After returning to the human world, Yuya goes to school and finds himself lost in thought about his newly acquired magical abilities. As the teacher takes the register, she announces an upcoming off-campus study, a camping trip that takes everyone by surprise. Yukon advises Yuya to be more aware of school activities before telling him that they will be going on a two-day camping trip in teams of four. The students form their groups, and Keed is excited to be in the same group as Yuya. Akira is also part of their team and begins to show off, but his antics are interrupted by Rin, the newest addition to their class. Rin introduces herself to everyone and notices Yuya's charm, causing her to understand why all the girls are going crazy over him. Yuya is a little embarrassed by her comment and quickly changes the subject. Yuya realizes he doesn't have a backpack for the camping trip, and Keith suggests they should go shopping together. 
They plan to meet at the mall after school, where everyone is surprised to see Kaori, the daughter of the chairman, joining them. The students are a bit intimidated by her, especially since she's attractive, but she's happy to help them and knows the mission plan is to help Yuya find a suitable backpack. The boys huddle together, pulling Yuya aside to inquire about his relationship with Kaori. They were curious about why Akira, another member of their group, was not present. Yuya informed them that Akira couldn't make it because of an unexpected situation. With that matter resolved, they continued on their mission for the day. Kaori led them to a store where they began to browse for camping gear. Yuya needed a new bag, and Kaori was more than happy to help him find one that would meet his needs. They finally found one that fit Yuya perfectly. After a quick test run, the group agreed that it was the perfect bag for him, and Yuya made his purchase. With their primary objective completed, Ryu suggested they have some fun. They headed towards an amusement plaza, and upon their arrival, they were delighted to find that the place was not crowded since it was a weekday. Yuya was amazed to see that the entire floor was an arcade. The group was soon drawn to a crane machine that had merchandise featuring Shingo's favorite idol. Shingo admitted that he wasn't good at crane games, and Yuya offered to play on his behalf. To everyone's amazement, Rizgod displayed his incredible skills and picked the merchandise with the highest chance of success. On his first try, he successfully retrieved the merchandise, and an ecstatic Shingo received his prize. The group then moved on to other games and attractions, and Yuya continued to showcase his skill at the arcade. Everyone requested that he win various items for them. Ryu suggested that they go to the 7th floor cafe for tea and snacks, but the ladies opted to go to the 13th floor, which was dedicated to girls' fashion. They promised to join the group later. As the boys arrived at the cafe, they attempted to act sophisticated by ordering coffee. However, both Yuya and Ryu found the coffee too bitter for their liking, much to Shingo's amusement. Meanwhile, back at the arcade, a machine with a broken wire started to spark, causing a minor commotion. Not long after the boys had taken a break for tea, the sound of the fire alarm interrupted them, signaling the outbreak of a fire on the 10th floor. It dawned on them that the arcade they were just at was where the outbreak had occurred. They decided to go against the evacuation order and head up the stairs to the upper floors, where the girls were located. As they climbed, Yuya noticed smoke already visible on their floor, indicating that the situation might be worse on the higher floors. One of the mall staff members tried to hurry them along with the evacuation process, but Yuya explained that they had friends on the upper floors and needed to reach them. Ryu received a call from Keed, who confirmed that they were trapped and running out of time. Yuya dashed past the staff member and headed straight to the upper floors. As they descended, the staff member escorted the other two boys down the stairs to safety. Yuya's thoughts raced as he considered the smiles on the girls' faces during their outing. He was determined to protect their happiness. He finally reached the floor where the fire had started, and the situation was dire. The sprinklers were ineffective at putting out the flames. Yuya knew that he had no other choice but to use his magic. He surrounded himself with water and dashed through the flames. When he arrived, the girls were lying unconscious near the women's washroom. Kaori tried to hold on and caught a glimpse of Yuya's silhouette before losing consciousness. However, our Giga Chet caught her just in time. After confirming that his friends were safe, Yuya used his location skill to check the building for anyone else who might be trapped. To his relief, they were the last ones to evacuate. Yuya uses his water magic to protect the three girls and prepare for their escape, but the fire becomes more intense and he doubts if his magic can hold out. Meanwhile, outside, firefighters are trying to extinguish the blaze and receive a report that there are four high school students still inside the building. Yuya searches for an exit but finds that the fire has blocked all the doors, and the upper floors are starting to collapse. He dodges the falling debris, but Kaori's badge falls, and he catches it. Yuya comes up with a plan to break his way through the floors and create a path down. He releases his power and begins breaking through the floors with great impact, creating a cloud of dust that can be seen from outside. Ryu and Shingo watch in amazement, waiting for the dust to settle. When the firefighters confirm that they are on the first floor, Ryu and Shingo rush over to them. Yuya assures everyone that they are fine, and the heroes of the blaze scold him for his reckless actions, but he apologizes. The girls are given oxygen to recover, and Kaori's father thanks Yuya again for saving his daughter's life. Yuya returns Kaori's badge to her, and she is happy. After the ordeal, Yuya returns home, and his dog, Knight, jumps on him excitedly, happy that he has returned. Yuya feels loved and longs for a proper family. In the fantasy world, 
the deity of kicks, Yasaji, is attacked by a mysterious girl with a sinister aura who uses the techniques of a divine archer. The girl reveals her goal to destroy the world, feeling like it's not worth protecting. She disappears, telling Yasaji that she will return, which worries him. He decides that he must find someone to pass on his kicking techniques to so that they can help stop this new foe. The episode starts with my boy Yuya remembering what Sage said about magic being the manifestation of imagination. He puts that knowledge to use and bam, he opens up a portal right in the middle of the forest. Now my boy can go anywhere he's been before just by thinking about it. That's pretty dope, but it's only limited to places he's already been to. But hey, it's still a useful power to have, especially since he's getting ready for a school trip. So, while Yuya and Knight are exploring the forest, they stumble upon a dark cave. Yuya uses his magic to light up the cave, and they come across some goblins. But no worries, they quickly take care of them with a combo attack. Yuya even finds some rare items that he puts in his item box. These two are getting better at fighting together, and Knight agrees. But when Yuya says he has to prepare for his school trip, Knight gets upset. However, they stumble upon Luna who's been injured and surrounded by some higher level goblins. Yua is ready to swoop in and save the day, but Knight reminds him that not all females need to be saved. So they watch as Luna puts up a good fight, even taking out the leader's arm. As the battle rages on, she skillfully uses her strings to block the attacks from three lackeys, but this leaves her vulnerable to a powerful kick from the goblin leader that sends her flying into a nearby tree. As she lays unconscious, the horde cheers on their victory. However, Yuya can't just stand there and watch as the monster prepares to finish her off. He interferes and takes out the goblin leader. But their triumph is short-lived as they soon realize they are surrounded by a vast number of high-level goblins. Yuya pulls out a whip and uses it to restrain and constrict the majority of the goblins while Knight finishes off the remaining. He then takes Luna away from the danger zone and comments that clearing most of the monsters in the zone will make it easier for Owen and the others during their next visit. Concerned about Luna's injuries, Yuya decides to bring her to his house to tend to her wounds. However, Knight disapproves of this plan. Luna regains consciousness just as she questions the Fenrir and becomes disoriented. She frantically requests Yuya to unhand her, kicking and screaming, causing him to drop her, and her head bounces off a nearby tree. Tears fill her eyes as she holds her head in pain. Yuya offers her a juice that can heal all things, informing her that it will also heal her wounds if she drinks it. Luna is skeptical at first, but Yuya assures her it's safe by taking a sip himself. She takes the risk and drinks the juice, which miraculously heals her wounds. Curious about Yuya, Luna asks who he is, and he takes the opportunity to introduce himself to her. However, Knight remains hostile towards Luna, which confuses Yuya. Luna understands why the Fenrir is weary of her and introduces herself, telling Yuya that they don't need to be so formal. Yuya then takes advantage of the situation and asks what brought her to such a dangerous place. Luna stammers a little before revealing that she was doing some training before getting attacked by the Goblin Elite Pack. Luna inquires about what happened to the goblins and Yuya informs her that he and Knight took them out. Impressed by their strength, Luna expresses her gratitude and asks Yuya what he's doing in the darkest regions. Yuya is caught off guard and stammers before revealing that he's also training. They both exchange a guilty laugh as it's obvious they are lying. Apologizing for making Yuya carry her, Luna complains about being filthy and prepares to look for a river to wash up. Yuya insists she uses a portable bath he acquired from a crystal deer, setting it up with a privacy screen for her to bathe in peace. Luna is shocked that Yuya defeated a legendary monster and attributes it to his training. She reveals that she's not in the area to train but to fulfill a customer's request. Luna suggests that they train together for a while, and Yuya agrees despite feeling guilty about turning her down. As they venture deeper into the forest and fight more goblins, Knight swiftly lands the finishing blow while the enemies are incapacitated. Since they are in the wilderness, they have no choice but to enjoy the tight goblin meat when not in combat. Luna and Yuya worked hard to improve their fighting skills by sparring and teaching each other new techniques and tactics. As a result, they both became stronger, which was evident when they teamed up to defeat a group of high-level goblins with ease. Yuya expressed his gratitude for Luna's help in honing her skills, but was saddened to hear that their training together would have to end due to Chad's upcoming school field trip. Despite this, Yuya suggested that they make the most of their final day together and stay focused on their training. They achieved their final session goal, and afterwards, Yuya relaxed in the bath with Knight. Luna surprised Yuya by joining him in the bath, explaining that she wanted to share the experience with him on their last day. Yuya was initially taken aback, but Luna expressed her gratitude for the way he had helped her grow stronger, and offered to wash his back. As they talked, Luna had a wardrobe malfunction, 
which embarrassed her. However, she explained to Yuya that their time together had shown her the brighter side of the world, and that she would treasure their experiences together. On the day of the field trip, Yuya and his classmates head towards their destination. While on the bus, they pass the time playing card games, and Yuya surprises everyone with his constant wins, which they later find out is because of his high luck stats. Yuya eventually retires to get some rest and is woken up by his classmates upon arriving at their destination. He is impressed by the quality of the facilities and the teachers inform the students about the off-campus trip. Their training involves surviving one night and two days in the wilderness with limited food resources. They are given only rice and are expected to forage and hunt for the rest of their meals. The mountain offers an abundance of edible plants and mushrooms while the river is teeming with fish for their protein needs. However, the students are anxious about differentiating between the edible and dangerous plants and mushrooms. Their teacher instructs them to show the plants and mushrooms before cooking, and the school doctor, Ms. Yamakawa, will be on site to treat any cases of poisoning. The students are surprised by her strange behavior, and their classmates give some exposition on her infirmary which is always shrouded in darkness with screams heard when passing by. Akira expresses his fear of the dangers, but their teacher rebukes him, stating that facing the dangers head-on is part of the coursework and a competition between the classes. She finally reveals that students' performance affects the bonus assessments of their homeroom teachers so they should fight like their lives depend on it. The students begin to panic a little when they find out that they will be camping in the wilderness and not sleeping in the fancy facility. They're given their tents and other basic supplies as they head out in their teams. While the others seriously inspect what they have been given, Akira is too busy giving himself hype. His teammates forget about him as they devise an action plan. Yuya and Keith are to go to the river to fish, while Akira and Kori will look for edible plants and mushrooms. As the team set out, Yuya uses his abilities to locate a hidden spot in the river with plenty of fish. Using skills he learned from Luna, he easily catches fish by hand, impressing his teammates with his fishing skills. However, his enthusiasm leads him to catch too many fish, and Keed has to stop him from overfishing. Meanwhile, Luna returns to her guild's headquarters, where she confirms that her skills are sharper than ever. She takes out her frustration on some dolls and is momentarily distracted when she thinks of Yuya, who she recognizes as being exceptionally handsome. Luna reveals that she has been an assassin since childhood and is known as the Headhunter. Though she wishes she had met Yuya earlier, she knows that her duty as a member of the Dark Guild requires her to keep her distance. She puts on her mask and prepares to leave the headquarters. Elsewhere, Princess Lexia sets off on a journey to the darkest regions to see Yuya again, indicating that her feelings for him have deepened. The episode kicks off with an exciting scene where Keed and Yuya successfully capture a multitude of fish, returning to the camp. They eagerly share this fantastic news with Rin, who is taken aback upon learning that Yuya caught the fish barehanded. Rin, having witnessed Yuya's impressive physical powers during their physical education lessons, is astounded by his skills. Suddenly, their attention is diverted by Akira, who appears to be in some weird yoga pose. Concerned, they inquire about what has happened to him. Rin advises them to disregard Akira, explaining that it is part of Rin's philosophy, known as the concept of Akira. Akira himself, meanwhile, has a mission to complete. He must retrieve a mushroom from a treacherous cliff and even taste a potentially poisonous one. Yuya becomes worried for Akira's safety and promptly examines his body, relieved to find no traces of poison. He encourages Akira, emphasizing the importance of staying excellent and not succumbing to stress. Akira expresses his gratitude, acknowledging Yuya as the only person who genuinely cares about his well-being. Their spirits lifted, they rejoice in their successful gathering of various vegetables and fish, which will serve as their meal. However, Akira can't help but complain about the effort he exerted in capturing them. Rin steps in to calm him down, soothing his frustrations. Meanwhile, Yuya utilizes his unique abilities to examine the wild vegetables. He identifies a variety of delicious options, including Japanese yen, black truffle, and mountain asparagus. He carefully removes any poisonous vegetables, ensuring their safety. The group then proceeds to the next step, where they must present their findings to Miss Sawada. While searching for her, Yuya catches sight of Kaori, the chairman's daughter, who is the reason they are at this location. They reunite with excitement, their friendship strong and filled with deep connections. Kaori's presence brings joy to Yuya, but their interaction is observed by their friends. At this moment, Kaori is called away by her friend to attend to her duties. Reluctantly, she bids farewell to Yuya and joins her friends, leaving him with a longing gaze. Now, it's Akira's turn to be overwhelmed with emotions, as he is consumed by jealousy due to his strong feelings for Kaori 
whom he considers a princess. Yuya, on the other hand, is shocked by Akira's misconception, as Kaori is not actually royalty. Nevertheless, everyone refers to her as princess due to her exceptional beauty and gentle demeanor. Akira's envy intensifies, making him wish he were in Yuya's shoes. The scene takes a surprising turn when the group approaches Ms. Sawada with their collection of vegetables. To their amazement, she quickly recognizes that the vegetables are poison-free with just a single glance. This group stands out from the rest, as they have gathered an abundance of fresh produce and other delicious edibles. Ms. Sawada is genuinely impressed, not just by the students, but also by the prospects of gaining unexpected points. With a note of caution, Ms. Sawada reminds them not to get overly excited because the main exam still awaits them. The challenge is to prepare a mouth-watering meal, and when she asks who will take on the role of chef, all eyes point to Yuya without hesitation. Yuya, without any reservations, has willingly taken on the responsibility and starts preparing fish in the middle of the forest. He showcases his culinary skills like a seasoned chef, leaving his friends astounded. Little did they know that their friend had hidden talents as a professional chef. After preparing the dishes, Yuya serves them to his friends, eagerly awaiting their reactions. With each bite, his friends are left speechless, unable to articulate their amazement. Yuya, on the other hand, finds the meal lacking in flavor, doubting his own culinary expertise. However, he gathers the courage to present his masterpiece to Ms. Sawada, hoping for a positive response. As she takes a bite, her expression mirrors that of his friends, leaving Yuya feeling nervous and uncertain. To his surprise, his friends and Ms. Sawada erupt with joy, showering praises upon Yuya's delectable creations. Ms. Sawada is particularly impressed to the extent that she jokingly contemplates marrying him. She openly shares her thoughts with her students, much to their astonishment. While Ms. Sawada may be an expert in her field of research, cooking, cleaning, and household chores are not her forte. Her dedication to her profession has left her with little time for such matters. Caught off guard by the unexpected proposal, Yuya's friends try to reason with Ms. Sawada, urging her to stay within the boundaries of their teacher-student relationship. The sudden revelation leaves them contemplating why she has remained single all this time. However, it is Tita, annoyed by the situation, who takes a stand against the marriage proposal. Tensions rise as Sawada, under the influence of alcohol, fails to comprehend the gravity of the situation. In a bid to gracefully decline her proposal, Yuya tries to defuse the situation with a lighthearted remark. The vast age difference and the strong student-teacher bond between them make it clear that pursuing a romantic relationship is not feasible. Ms. Sawada, unfortunately, misinterprets their arguments and, in a surprising gesture, playfully pushes Yuya's head onto her DDs, leaving the other teachers astounded. Realizing the extent of Ms. Sawada's infatuation, the other teachers step in, attempting to bring her back to her senses and reminding her of the importance of maintaining professional boundaries. Meanwhile, Kid takes it upon herself to rescue Yuya from the clutches of Sawada, understanding the need to protect him from a potentially complicated situation. Sawada refuses to let him go, relentlessly pressing his face further. Meanwhile, Kid pleads with Rin to join in, relishing the captivating scene. Rin, known for her intelligence, warns Keat about the suffocating situation. Momentarily releasing him, she contemplates the enchanting paradise she created for him. On another note, Akira seethes with jealousy, yearning to be a part of the enthralling encounter. Yuwa returns to his magical home, where his faithful pet Knight eagerly awaits him. Taking cues from his master, Knight joyfully prepares a meal for Yuya. Yuya expresses his delight, basking in the compliments from friends about his culinary prowess. With a satisfied smile, he sets off on an unmissable adventure, continuing his thrilling field trip. As the scene shifts, boys are seen changing their clothes, drawing the attention of every student, including Yuya, who finds it rather peculiar. Curious, he questions Akira about the cause, only to notice Akira's well-defined abs and chiseled physique. Doubts arise as Yuya wonders why his friend has been secretly hitting the gym, fueling Akira's jealousy, as he not only possesses good looks but also a strong physique to attract girls. Meanwhile, the girls are changing their attire. Rin mischievously begins teasing her peers, boasting about her ability to captivate anyone she desires. However, her boast is quickly countered when it's revealed that her assets are not as ample as she claims. Yukine and Kaori arrive, and Kib complains about Rin's teasing. 
They share their thoughts, discussing Ms. Sawada's proposal to Yuya. After tasting his delectable food, Rin believes she can sway him with her ample assets. Kid contemplates following Sawada's supposed plan with Yuya. Meanwhile, Kaori and Yukine worry about their own lack of ample assets, questioning whether Yuya truly prefers larger assets. They feel it's unfair, especially since Kid possesses such generous proportions. Night falls, and we find ourselves near the campsite. As everyone awakens, they discover a chaotic scene with their provisions missing, including mushrooms and other edible items. Akira, his face turned toward the forest, sheds tears of despair, while his friends fret over their meal options. Fortunately, their supplies remain intact, prompting them to venture into the forest in search of breakfast. In the forest, amidst their search for safe, non-poisonous mushrooms, the group remembers to call upon Akira for assistance. While everyone is preoccupied, Yuya's attention is drawn to Akira who remains fixated on a peculiar tree with deep claw-like scars. Intrigued, Yuya taps into Akira's thoughts, discovering his awareness of a bear's presence nearby. Growing cautious, Yuya desires to alert his friends, but time is not on his side. Suddenly, the bear emerges, launching an attack that sends their screams echoing through the woods. With the bear in hot pursuit, the vigilant teachers swiftly guide the children to stay close, navigating through various obstacles. Following their guidance, Yuya and his friends head toward Ms. Sawada who hides behind a desk, urging them to seek refuge behind a nearby bench. As the bear smashes through the desk, momentarily disoriented, Sawada commands them to form a line with their fellow students. They race towards safety, while another teacher quickly calls the police for assistance in dealing with the bear. In a critical moment, Sawada slips and falls, left defenseless before the bear's menacing claws. However, Yuya steps forward like a true hero, bravely engaging in a fierce struggle with the powerful beast. Though weakened from the intense battle, Yuya manages to overpower and subdue the bear, ultimately saving Sawada from harm. Impressed by Yuya's incredible strength, Sawada acknowledges her duty as a teacher to reprimand him for risking his life. Yet, she recognizes that without his intervention, she may have met a dire fate. Grateful for his bravery, Sawada desires to reward him, but Yuya humbly declines, prompting Sawada to grant him time to reconsider. While the bear lies defeated, the group remains on edge, aware that it could awaken at any moment. Anxiously awaiting the arrival of the police, they grapple with the urgent need to ensure the bear is properly handled. Yumikawa suggests administering a drug to subdue the bear, but the cautious teachers veto the idea aware of the potential complications that often arise from using her concoctions. Fortunately, Kaori arrived with the police just in time. They swiftly bound the bear with sturdy ropes, intending to utilize it as a guard bear within their facility. Kaori, being the daughter of the chairman, granted permission for this unconventional choice. However, a student raises concerns about the bear's potential danger to people. Kaori assures them that if the guard bear dares to harm anyone, it will serve as its own meal. The group finds solace in this plan, and even the bear seems to perspire nervously upon hearing her words. Following the harrowing incident, their outdoor studies come to a close, and they make their way back home. Once there, they resume their training in the treacherous forest. Knight and Yuya find themselves face to face with a horde of menacing monsters, realizing these creatures could pose a threat to Lexia and her warriors. Without hesitation, they dive into the battle with Knight leading the charge. The monsters launch their attacks, but Yuya renders them futile, countering with a powerful swing of his enormous hammer that obliterates the foes. Yuya, witnessing this awe-inspiring fight, can't help but marvel at Sage, the mastermind behind such splendid weapons. Meanwhile, a hidden observer, a rabbit, keenly watches the unfolding spectacle. After the victorious battle, they stumble upon a mysterious mask, which Yuya decides to don. Surprisingly, it suits him perfectly. Just then, a knight and Princess Lexia appear before them. Confirming Yuya's identity, they express their intention to bring him to the royal palace. Eagerly accepting the invitation, Yuya graciously acknowledges Lexia's gratitude, bowing before her. However, their moment is abruptly interrupted when the knight shoves Lexia to the ground, revealing a falling tree aimed at them. Acting swiftly, Yuya shatters the tree into pieces using his formidable weaponry. In the aftermath, he discovers Luna's sharp thread, a distinctive belonging. Yuya senses the presence of the culprit nearby and swiftly subdues them. As the mysterious assailant falls, their face is unveiled, and they lose consciousness. Yuya is surprised to see Luna, not considering her a malevolent girl. Lexia arrives on the scene, believing that Yuya knows Luna. Yuya doesn't deny her assumption and seeks permission to bring Luna to his house for a brief discussion. Without hesitation, Lexia grants him permission, concerned for Luna's well-being. 
Lexia's warriors, worried for their princess, are instructed to accompany Luna and Lexia to Yuya's home. With Luna and Lexia in tow, Yuya leads the way to his house. Lexia is determined to uncover the connection between Luna and Yuya, as well as the reason behind Luna's attempted attack. Utilizing their teleportation magic, they swiftly arrive at Yuya's home. Meanwhile, the knight remains perplexed about the princess's welfare and seeks answers as they enter Yuya's house. In this exciting episode, Lexia is feeling restless and has two things on her mind. First, she wants to understand the mysterious connection between her and Yuya. Second, she's curious about teleportation magic, but Yuya doesn't think it's important and dismisses it as just an illusion. Lexia sets him straight, explaining that teleportation magic is only found in fairy tales and can only be used by legendary people. She warns Yuya that getting involved with teleportation magic leads to inevitable conflict. Yuya is shocked by this revelation and begins to grasp the significance of this magical ability. Lexia promises not to use teleportation magic around others unless it's absolutely necessary. Yuya agrees to her proposal. Aside from her interest in teleportation magic, Lexia also wants to learn the special techniques Yuya has mastered. She notices that Luna, who pretends to be asleep, also possesses this awakening ability. Yuya notices it too but chooses to ignore it out of kindness. However, Lexia confronts Luna and asks about her intentions to harm her. Luna remains indifferent and reveals that she wants Lexia to take her own life. Yuya interrupts and shares his reason for wanting to know about Luna's plot to assassinate the princess. Feeling trapped and with Yuya's unwavering curiosity, Luna has no choice but to reveal her dark past. Through a sad flashback, we learn that Luna was an orphan living a miserable life. She survived by rummaging through trash and wearing tattered clothes she found. Stealing became her way of surviving, pretending to be the people whose belongings she stole. But whenever they tried to catch her, Luna would disappear without a trace, like smoke. But things took a dark turn when Luna met a mysterious master who showed her affection, but also had a sinister plan for her. He became her teacher, not just in regular subjects but also in the deadly skills of killing. With his guidance, Luna became a merciless assassin, taking the lives of many innocent people. What she didn't know was that her master was part of the evil Dark Guild, a group known for their involvement in drugs, theft, and murder. When the truth came out, the princess was shocked to discover Luna's connection to such a wicked organization. As Luna slowly realized the gravity of her situation, she found herself trapped. Her association with the Dark Guild was forced upon her through her master's ties, and she had no way to escape. She became the top assassin, with the grim task of killing the princess of Arcelia Kingdom. She knew that attempting such an act was unforgivable, and would lead to her downfall if she tried to run away from the Dark Guild. Hugo felt anguish in his heart because he had come to see Luna as a friend. But Luna thought his concern was just sympathy since they hadn't known each other for long. Yua couldn't bear to see his friend suffer and decided to take action. His loyalty to their friendship made him determined to change Luna's fate. Meanwhile, Lexia, who understood the situation well, came up with a plan. Only she and Yuya knew Luna's true identity as the assassin, and they wanted to keep it that way. Lexia offered Luna a chance to redeem herself by becoming the princess's protector. The tables had turned, and Luna now had to make a crucial decision. The kind-hearted princess chose to overlook Luna's past wrongdoings, seeing the potential for her to change. She insisted that Luna's hands were soft and free from stains, offering her a chance at redemption. Luna, inspired by the princess's words, felt a glimmer of hope. The princess offered Luna the opportunity to become her bodyguard, hoping it would help Luna break free from her dark past. However, Luna felt guilty and believed she didn't deserve to be in the presence of such purity. But the wise princess gently reminded Luna that her hands, though stained, could still find purity and renewal. Luna couldn't keep her secret any longer and admitted that she didn't want to become the princess's bodyguard. Her words slipped out, defying her own intentions. But the princess insisted that Luna obey, mentioning her failed assassination attempt. Luna, surprised by the princess's determination, reluctantly agreed. Meanwhile, the knights and soldiers, pursued by dangerous monsters, fled into the forest, worried about the princess's safety. Luna's curiosity got the better of her, and she asked if the princess would make decisions on her behalf. The princess confidently brought up the topic of a secret bath. Luna, impressed by the princess's charm, couldn't keep the secret any longer and revealed the magical bath that enhanced beauty and power. Intrigued by this revelation, the princess expressed her desire to use Yuya's bathtub. Yuya, willing to help, agreed to her request. Unexpectedly, the princess invited Luna to join her in the bath, and she also extended the invitation to Yuya, 
who politely declined. As they soaked in the warm water, the princess felt a deep sense of tranquility, and Luna found comfort in the soothing bath, temporarily forgetting their worries. In the peaceful atmosphere, Luna found herself on the edge of a revelation. The princess, asking about Luna's feelings for Yuya, accidentally caused Luna to almost slip and fall into the tub. Luna tried to hide her emotions and pretended to be just friends. But Lexia, sensing that Luna had deeper feelings for Yuya despite her denials, was determined to uncover the truth. Lexia announced her plan to marry Yuya, provoking Luna to openly object. Lexia, understanding Luna's desires, revealed her own feelings for Yuya, sparking a rivalry between them as they battled for Yuya's heart. Both rivals accepted the challenge, unaware of their vulnerability as they sat naked in the bathtub. Luna, now both the princess's bodyguard and rival, confessed her true desires. After their bath, the two rivals sat calmly at the table. Yuya, wanting to be a good host, took charge of preparing dinner for their important guests. However, Lexia interrupted and insisted on taking over the meal preparation. Her presence was invaluable, and she displayed her knife skills with expertise. Cooking was unfamiliar to her as she grew up as a princess in the palace, but she persevered. Once, the knife slipped from her hand but luckily missed Luna and Yuya. To avoid any accidents, Lexia stepped back from the task. Beauty, recognizing the need, showcased her own culinary talent and created a feast suitable for royalty. The delicious aroma filled the air, making everyone's mouths water. Lexia and Luna praised Beauty for her culinary success, and Yuya was happy to have pleased them. Lexia couldn't contain her affection and held on to Yuya's arm, silently expressing her love. Luna, observing this, pretended to be injured to divert attention. However, her injuries weren't severe enough to skip dinner, so she cunningly ordered Yuya to eat on her behalf. Oblivious to her manipulation, Yuya obediently fed Luna bites of food. Lexia felt jealous and commanded Yuya to feed her instead. Confused but compliant, Yuya started to do as she asked, unaware of Luna's plan to get closer to him. As they enjoyed the delicious meal, they offered Yuya a metal spoon, knowing he hadn't eaten anything yet. After a satisfying meal, they all went to sleep. Luna and Lexia shared a bed, while Yuya settled on the couch. As they drifted off to sleep, thoughts of the eventful day filled their minds. In the morning, a knight who had survived the monster attack found them. Relieved to see the princess unharmed, the knight apologized for his sudden absence. They acknowledged that there would be a better time for questions and discussions. Yuya introduced Luna to the knight as the princess's bodyguard. However, Luna's admission that she had once planned to harm the princess raised suspicions among the knight and warriors. They pointed their swords at Luna and questioned her loyalty. Luna tried to convince them of her loyalty, but time was running out. Luna felt relieved when she realized that Lexia was pretending not to know anything. Lexia then explained the situation to dispel the knight's doubts, revealing that she had shared a bed with Luna as part of a necessary plan while she actually spent the night at Yuya's house. The knight lowered the sword but remained cautious. Rebuilding trust wouldn't be easy. While Luna felt relieved that she was no longer accused, Yuya dropped another bombshell. He declared that he wouldn't be joining them because he had something personal to attend to. He couldn't visit the palace because he had an important class to attend. The group took a moment to process this new information. Knight, unable to defy Yuya's decision, urged him to go to the palace as soon as possible. He provided directions for Yuya to follow the road to the nearby village and ask for directions to the palace. With their departure imminent, Luna thanked the knight and said goodbye. Lexia also bid him farewell, filled with excitement. As Luna rode on her horse, she suddenly jumped off and kissed Yuya's cheek gratefully, begging him not to forget her and the upcoming war. Lexia noticed the kiss and demanded the carriage to stop, but the knight ignored her request and continued their journey. While Lexia wanted a similar affectionate moment with Yuya, she suppressed her desire for now. Meanwhile, Yuya stumbles upon a river and is taken aback by its beauty, having never encountered one before. Feeling enticed, he decides to indulge in a refreshing bath, realizing the joy of outdoor bathing. During his bath, he discovers that he is not alone. A small red boar-like creature accompanies him. Intrigued, Yuya assesses the creature's abilities and determines that it is a scarlet boar with a power level of approximately 490. Testing its skills, he asks the boar to demonstrate healing magic. As the boar performs the magic, Yuya experiences a lightness in his body. Inspired by this creature, he names it Akatsuki, symbolizing the color of the sky at dusk. As a reminder of his responsibilities, the knight interrupts Yuya's bath with a clock, alerting him that they are running late. Fortunately, they manage to arrive at the class on time. 
In class, the teacher explains the upcoming ball tournament, emphasizing the importance of skill and announcing that scores will be awarded accordingly. Moving outside, the physical education teacher divides the students into two teams, this regarding gender. As Yua is unfamiliar with the game's rules, he is assigned as the goalkeeper. On the opposing team, Ryu, a skilled player, dominates the game, preventing the other team from gaining control of the ball and effortlessly launching it towards their goal. Tita and Rin, observing the match, acknowledge Ryu's team's strength and realize they need a trump card to turn the tide. In a daring move, Rin instructs Keed to jump, captivating everyone's attention with the mesmerizing motion of her melons. To further distract the boys, Rin proceeds to fondle Keed's big melons in plain sight. Despite their attempts to remain unaffected, the boys struggle to avert their gaze. Akira, keenly aware of Rin's ploy, intercepts the ball from Yuya's team before swiftly losing it. Just as the ball approaches the net, Yuya astonishingly catches it, leaving everyone stunned. They question if he had somehow teleported, but dismiss the notion as impossible. Prompted by their astonishment, Yuya is urged to throw the ball as far as he can. Tapping into his latent power, he hurls the ball, scoring an incredible goal from a remarkable distance. Onlookers are left dumbfounded, their mouths agape. Unfazed by their reactions, Yuya eagerly awaits confirmation of his goal, aware that everything now hinges on the judgment that awaits him. The episode unfolds with everyone commending Yuya for his exceptional football performance. Another tournament is scheduled to take place at the school, and Yuya's participation is already confirmed. While contemplating his chances of winning, one thing is certain, he will give it his all on their way back home. Their conversation is interrupted by the president, who straightforwardly proposes that Yuya join Shopees. The offer seems like a golden opportunity, contrary to Yuya's expectations. However, he declines this tempting offer, leaving the president astonished. Most young people are eager to work in Shobis, yet Yuya shows no interest. Not only would he have financial gains and popularity, but he would also have the chance to meet renowned actors and famous players. Despite these perks, Yuya values his ordinary yet enjoyable life and understands the difficulty of extricating himself from the entertainment industry once involved. His friends try to persuade him to seize this fantastic opportunity, while the president scolds his secretary for failing to convince this determined man. The secretary's sole responsibility is to locate Yuya and establish contact, but the president intensifies the pressure on him. Ryu and Shingo find themselves in awe as they encounter a stunning and vibrant actress Mew. To their surprise, she is acquainted with their friend Yuya and converses with him as if they were good friends. Yuya is bewildered by this situation. They refer to her as being brought here to persuade him, although she expresses objections, indicating that she is being coerced. The president presents them with a magazine that has already gained popularity due to Yuya's attractive appearance. The president is determined to keep this golden goose and is willing to go to any lengths to obtain Yuya's approval. However, a pamphlet catches Yuya's attention. It reveals an upcoming tournament in which Yuya will participate. The president sees this as an opportunity and plans to capture Yuya's picture at the tournament with the help of the Aosei Academy. He intends to send the pictures to publishers without permission. As they head towards the principal's office, Yuya watches them with confusion. In another scene, Yuya and his friends are training in the forest. Yuya demonstrates his strength by defeating a monster with a single strike, causing its bones to scatter. Knight and Akatsuki accompany him as he seeks to become even stronger and more proficient in magic and swordsmanship. Despite his progress, he feels a sense of inadequacy and desires to enhance his abilities. Contemplating this, he decides to venture deeper into the dangerous forest. He comes across an extraordinary thorny black tree that possesses mysterious qualities and cannot be broken except with the magic of an elf. Intrigued by the tree's rare properties, he urges his companions to exercise caution, aware of the increasing dangers. Suddenly, he notices a colossal monster, initially mistaking it for his adorable Akatsuki. However, to his surprise, the other creature is a separate monster that forcefully knocks him to the ground. This formidable monster surpasses Yuya's expectations in both power and skill. Despite his attempts to heal his wounds with a potion, the monster relentlessly attacks, denying him any chance of recovery. With determination, Yuya rises to his feet, resolved to stop the monster in its tracks. 
giving his pets an opportunity to escape. Suddenly, a commanding voice echoes from the depths of the dark forest. A savior emerges, a small, adorable rabbit, ready to lend a hand by swiftly overpowering the powerful beast with a single kick. The heroic entry surprises Yuya and his companions, as the rabbit not only greets them, but also speaks simultaneously. The defeated monster attempts a counterattack. Unaware of the formidable opponent it faces, the rabbit effortlessly delivers another kick, obliterating the monster, and even causing nearby trees to crumble with its sheer display of power. Intrigued, Yuya seeks to learn more about this extraordinary rabbit. He checks its status and discovers that it possesses incredible strength. To assess their power, Yuya requests that they demonstrate their kicks. However, Akatsuki, not wanting to be outdone, confidently struts forward as if unbeatable. The rabbit, known as Kick Rabbit, assesses Akatsuki with a single glance. Next, it's Knight's turn to showcase his talent, surpassing Akatsuki's kick. Inspired by their abilities, Yuya executes a magnificent kick, impressing them with his technique. He even creates a hole in an impenetrable black tree, widening everyone's eyes. Intrigued by Kick Rabbit's skills, Yuya begins training under its guidance, learning how to move his legs and defeat enemies with a single powerful kick. During their fight, Kick Rabbit shows no mercy, pushing Yai to his physical limits. Yuya wonders why Kick Rabbit is teaching him, and the answer lies in his decision to reject a girl who threatened the forest. Yuya's pets observe the intense battle, unaware of the passing time until the sun emerges. They then retire to the house, where Yuya expresses gratitude for the techniques taught by Kick Rabbit, acknowledging it as his master. However, Yuya wonders why he has been chosen as Kick Rabbit's successor and ponders the purpose behind maintaining balance. Kick Rabbit reveals that it has gained the title of God and explains that there are other rabbits in the world who, as deities, must choose successors to ensure balance. Kick Rabbit intends to bestow its knowledge upon Yuya, preparing him to confront the forces of evil that threaten nature and humanity. The intensity of their training exceeds their expectations. When a skilled beast master masters a specific art, they become a deity. Kick Rabbit recognizes Yuya's potential and envisions him as the one who can vanquish evil. However, Yuya contemplates refusing this path, desiring an ordinary life. Despite his inclination to decline, Yuya realizes there is much he can learn from Kick Rabbit, as he needs to become stronger to overcome powerful adversaries. In exchange for his guidance, Kick Rabbit seeks to teach Yuya a unique and extraordinary form of magic rooted in darkness, which would amplify his powers. Intrigued by this opportunity, Yuya recalls his previous training with Mr. Sage and agrees to the arrangement. With a handshake, they cement their roles as master and apprentice. Kick Rabbit commences training in the forest, setting Yuya the task of pursuing the mighty mithril boar and seeking revenge on its behalf. Yuya initially believes it is too soon to exact revenge, evading the mithril boar's relentless attacks. Despite the immense challenge, he channels all his efforts into defeating the formidable creature. His pets and Kick Rabbit observe the spectacle, with Knight expressing concern for his master and desiring to aid him. However, Kick Rabbit insists that Yuya must rely on his own choices. Yuya then employs the hunter item from his inventory, ensnaring the mithril boar and ultimately overpowering it. It seems impossible, yet Yuya's triumph brings joy to both his pets and Kick Rabbit, leaving Yuya elated. However, Kick Rabbit expects more from Yuya, urging him to slay a monster with a single kick. Yuya continues to train relentlessly checking his status and discovering newfound treasures and increased power. Yet he realizes he is still not formidable enough to combat evil. It is then that the evolution process begins, causing Yuya to panic. Kick Rabbit reassures him that it is a natural occurrence, explaining that the evolution does not alter his appearance, but significantly enhances his power and skills. Fatigued, Yuya is advised to rest and engage in other activities. In the school setting, preparations for the tournament are underway, and Yuya is grateful that there are no adverse effects from his evolution. Suddenly, the president appears, ready to capture Yuya's pictures, investing in his potential as a performer in the tournament. 
a ping pong champion who is an avid observer of Yuya's skills, appears. Yuya is known for his ability to manipulate situations to his advantage, but the champion threatens that this time he won't let Yuya win. As the ping pong game commences, Yuya's opponent proves to be formidable, having previously played at the national level. The opponent's aggressive playing style worries the audience. Unfazed by the challenge, Yuya responds by using his extraordinary powers to drill a hole in the table, leaving everyone astonished. His display is met with awe and disbelief, leading the opponent to withdraw from the game. Following this, Yuya encounters Cade, who asks him to join her volleyball team as a replacement for an injured player. Reluctantly, Yuya agrees aware that his involvement might lead to chaos. The president overhears their conversation and rushes his cameraman to the volleyball stadium. However, the cameraman focused solely on capturing provocative shots of Katie's figure, which infuriates the president when he reviews the footage. Meanwhile, Yuya's explosive moves in the game cause the opposing team to withdraw. Despite his disruptive reputation, Yuya's friends console him, celebrating their victory. However, another challenge arises in the form of Kaiori, who pleads for Yuya's assistance as her teammate is injured. The injured player warns Yuya about Kaiori's aggressive behavior on the tennis court. Yuya realizes that Kaiori is responsible for her teammate's injuries due to her lack of skill. Determined to prevent further harm, Yuya confronts the open players and defeats them, not allowing Kaiori to showcase her destructive skills. Finally, Kaiori gets the opportunity to demonstrate her devastated abilities, but Yuya intervenes, playing on her behalf and securing victory. Their exceptional performance earns them praise from everyone. As they head home, Kaiori invites Yuya to join her, expressing her gratitude. Yuya politely declines, content with walking alongside her. Overjoyed, Kaiori shows her appreciation by kissing Yuya on the cheek. The episode concludes with this heartwarming moment. The episode begins with the manager of a model agency who just finished creating a special edition magazine. He's so thrilled with his masterpiece and thinks he has found the perfect way to bring Yuya into the spotlight. He believes that once the magazine hits the shelves, Yuya will receive so much attention that he won't be able to resist becoming a model. But here comes the director, always the voice of reason, asking how on earth they plan to convince Yuya to join their team. The manager confidently explains that once the magazine is out, everyone will be clamoring to have Yuya on board. He predicts that countless organizations will be dying to snatch him up, leaving Yuya with a ton of options. And of course, the sly manager concludes that Yuya will be left with no choice but to join their agency. Sneaky, huh? The manager is convinced this plan is foolproof, assuring his director that they'll pull it off without a hitch. He immediately orders the sales and marketing team to kick into high gear, getting the magazine out there in no time. Meanwhile, Yuya gets an unexpected visitor at his doorstep, none other than Kaori. Yep, she's decided to pay him a surprise visit. As she enters his house, she spots his adorable pets, Knight and Akatsuki, and can't help but gush over how cute they are. They settle down to study together, and Kaori kindly assists Yuya with a tricky math problem. Once he solves it, he gratefully praises her for helping him study so well. In return, she playfully reminds him that he had also been her language mentor, teaching her both English and Japanese. Yuya, lost in his thoughts, accidentally blurts out that he learned those languages in another world. Oops. Realizing his slip-up, Yuya apologizes profusely and clams up, hoping to brush it off. But you must be curious about how Kaori ended up at his house in the first place and how they ended up studying together. Well, let's rewind a bit to after the sports competition. Kaori caught up with Yuya, bursting with gratitude for his help in her competition. As they strolled together that day, she slyly reminded him about their upcoming exam and asked how his preparation was going. The moment she posed that question, his face turned as gloomy as a rainy day. Perplexed, she inquired about his sudden change in demeanor, and he spilled the beans. Yuya confessed that he had a serious problem with mathematics, unable to comprehend it no matter how hard he tried. He had no idea how he would manage to pass the exam. Kaori couldn't help but smile at his plight, remarking how surprising it was to discover that someone as talented as him could have a weak spot. She playfully teased him, saying, Mathematics is a piece of cake. 
Are you sure you didn't accidentally mistake numbers for vegetables? Then, she proposed a brilliant idea. Since you clearly needed her help in mathematics, why not have study sessions together at his place? With a mischievous grin, she added, Plus, it's about time I explore the mysteries of your humble abode, considering I'll be the first female visitor ever. Yuya, feeling a mix of excitement and nervousness, agreed to her proposition and invited her over. And so, that's how they ended up in their current situation. As they immersed themselves in their studies, Kaori suddenly felt a pressing need to use the bathroom. Yuya described the route to her, but he didn't accompany her. As she headed towards the restroom, Yuya's mind wandered through countless scenarios, worried about how he was doing as a host to his first female guest. Meanwhile, as Kaori tried to locate the toilet, she found herself drawn towards a different door. Unbeknownst to Yuya, she ventured closer, almost ready to step into a whole new dimension. Just in the nick of time, Yuya arrived, his mind still juggling different thoughts. He stared at her in astonishment and asked, What on earth are you doing there? That's definitely not the way to the bathroom I described. Caught off guard, Kaori confessed that she knew it wasn't the right way, but something from that room had called out to her while she was on her way to the bathroom. She admitted that it might have been wrong to intrude on his privacy, and apologized sincerely. However, instead of scolding her, Yuya dropped a bombshell. He asked her if she would believe him if he told her that the door she stood before was the entrance to another world. Perplexed, Kaori had no idea what he fucking meant. She questioned the concept of another world and took a step closer as Yuya approached her. With a mischievous glimmer in his eyes, Yuya instructed Kaori to place her hand on the door. As she tentatively obeyed, she witnessed an invisible lock materializing before her very eyes. Yuya explained that the door led to a parallel world, one filled with skills and magic that didn't exist on Earth. As they stepped into Yuya's sprawling compound in this parallel universe, Kaori's eyes widened with wonder. The sight before her was beyond anything she had ever imagined. She couldn't contain her excitement and had to ask Yuya, her guide in this strange land, if they had truly entered a new world, distinct from the familiar confines of Earth. With a knowing smile, he confirmed her question, setting her heart aflutter with anticipation. The air was infused with an intriguing aroma as Kaori explored the compound. Exotic fruits and vegetables adorned the vibrant marketplace, teasing her senses with their alluring colors and unfamiliar shapes. Each item seemed like a portal to undiscovered flavors and culinary adventures. In the midst of their exploration, Kaori couldn't contain her curiosity any longer. She turned to Yuya, remembering their encounters with Knight and Akatsuki. She longed to unravel the secrets behind these captivating beings. With enthusiasm, Yuya delved into an explanation, describing Knight as a rare species called the Little Fenrir majestic creatures akin to wolves. However, their understanding of Akatsuki's species remained elusive, leaving them both yearning for answers. Despite their shared curiosity, neither of them possessed knowledge about the enigmatic Manju species. A spark of an idea ignited within Kaori as she playfully suggested a connection to pigs. However, her innocent remark didn't sit well with Akatsuki, whose anger flared at the mention. Recognizing their misstep, they both admitted their conjectures might be far from the truth. Eager to continue their journey, they left the younger ones behind, venturing further into the unknown. Along the way, Kaori's eyes widened in astonishment as a mysterious system materialized before her, leaving her awestruck. Intrigued, she turned to Yuga, seeking answers. He revealed that it was a system known as stats in this world, a way to measure one's abilities and potential. As Yuya examined Kaori's stats, a look of astonishment flashed across his face. Her stats surpassed his own, leaving them both marveling at her untapped potential. In a heartfelt confession, Yuya shared the story of his transformation since arriving in this world. He spoke of his past self, once the lowest of the low, overweight and disconnected from those around him. But within this realm, he had blossomed, shedding weight and gaining muscles. Moreover, all the extraordinary powers he had displayed, even during the bandit attack and the school fire, were bestowed upon him by this mysterious world. Kaori listened attentively, not particularly interested in the tales themselves but captivated by Yuya's willingness to share his vulnerabilities. Yuya confessed that he believed he had been using a cheat, a shortcut to connect with people like her. He acknowledged that without this advantage, he couldn't fathom building such relationships. Kaori smiled warmly, touched by his openness. She longed to experience more of this extraordinary world, urging Yuya to take her to the forest. However, he hesitated, cautioning her about the presence of monsters lurking within. 
Yuki explained that a protective barrier shielded them from harm inside the building, ensuring their safety. Undeterred, Kaori made a promise, raising her hand to intertwine her pinky with Yuya's. It was a vow, sealed in secrecy, as she pledged to keep his revelations safe within her heart. Sensing the depth of their connection, she wondered aloud if this shared secret made their relationship special. Yuya feigned ignorance, unable to comprehend her question, but Kaori didn't seek an answer. She understood that the mere act of sharing these intimate moments made her feel cherished and unique in Yuya's eyes. With their unspoken bond cemented, Yuya urged them to return to their own world, reminding Kaori of their impending exams. They couldn't let this extraordinary adventure hinder their academic pursuits. Meanwhile, back at Lexia's home, she eagerly greets her father, but he can't help but inquire about the missing boy they had gone to bring. Owen steps up to apologize on Yuya's behalf, explaining that unforeseen circumstances prevented them from bringing Yuya along. The king's curiosity peaks as he wonders if Luna, the new guard they had introduced, had something to do with it. Luna steps forward, admitting her identity as the renowned assassin from the Dark Guild, known as Headhunter. She reveals that she had indeed attempted to take Lexia's life but failed. Surprisingly, instead of executing Luna for her failure, the king questions why she is still alive, reminding her that failed assassinations typically result in death. Luna reveals that the person who hired her as a guard refuses to let her die. Enraged by Luna's audacity, the king raises his great sword to strike her down. But before he can deliver the fatal blow, Luna mysteriously restrains his hand. Astonished, the king wonders how she managed to stop his sword. Lexia, caught in the midst of the chaos, becomes furious with her father for attacking her friend. She boldly declares her hatred towards him, taking a stand for Luna's life. Recognizing his mistake, the king apologizes and accepts Luna as Lexia's guard. He humbly asks Luna to release him from her binding. Luna obliges, freeing him from her grip. As tensions ease, King Arnold later meets with Owen who reveals that Yuya once again saved Lexia from danger. Owen shares the astonishing revelation that Luna is the legendary assassin, and Yuya had taken both her and Lexia to his house for the night. This news doesn't sit well with the king, who becomes infuriated, feeling that Yuya had overstepped boundaries by meeting his daughter inappropriately. He vows to kill Yuya upon his arrival. Meanwhile, the prince receives information from his spies about Lexia's failed assassination and Luna's new role as Lexia's guard. Additionally, they inform him that Yuya will soon visit the city to meet the king. Seizing an opportunity to expedite his ascent to the throne, the prince proposes a devious plan to the assassin. He offers his secret, his magic barrier portion, in exchange for eliminating King Arnold, Lexia, Luna, and Owen. The assassin warns him of the risks, including his own potential demise. Undeterred, the prince sees an opportunity to shift the blame onto Yuya if things go awry. Amidst the brewing chaos, Yuya finds himself granted a holiday from school following the sports festival. He decides to visit the king and Lexia, embarking on his journey. Along the way, he encounters sheep, taking the opportunity to gather their fur horns, and even bedding made from their bodies. Arriving at the first village, Yuya marvels at the unfamiliar sights and creatures with tails, only to realize he lacks the funds to fully enjoy the city's offerings. Undeterred, Yuya enters a store to trade his goods for money, but he is met with accusations of nobility by the merchant. Eventually, he manages to sell some pepper, which the merchant claims is of the highest quality he has ever seen. Yuya receives his gold coins and continues his journey, following the merchant's directions to find a carriage. Eventually, Yuya arrives at the royal capital and is escorted to the palace by Owen. King Arnold, initially furious about Yuya spending the night with his daughter, accuses him of seducing her. The tension rises as Arnold brandishes his sword, ready to strike Yuya. Owen intervenes, explaining that Yuya unknowingly disrespected the king by offering betting as a gift, which signifies a desire to take the lady away. Just as the situation reaches its breaking point, the assassins spring into action, activating a barrier, believing that no one can use magic within its confines. However, much to their surprise, Yuya effortlessly defeats them, leaving him beaming with joy. Lexia rushes towards Yuya, embracing him. This gesture infuriates her father further, and he directs his anger towards Yuya, raising his sword once again. In a heated confrontation, Lexia defends Yuya, questioning her father's actions when Yuya had just saved them. In a desperate attempt to find evidence, Owen discovers a sum of money and a crest in the assassin's pocket. He reveals to the king that the crest belongs to Riger, Lexia's brother. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Owen turns to Yuya, beseeching him to lend his skills to save their troubled kingdom. And with that the episode comes to an end.
Welcome back to Anna Spoiler. Today, I'm excited to dive into episode 12 of I Got a Cheat Skill in Another World and Became Unrivaled in the Real World. In our previous episode, we were introduced to the remarkable divines, extraordinary individuals who have reached the pinnacle of their expertise. Their noble mission is to safeguard the world from the menacing force known as the Vile. In this episode, our protagonist, Yuya, finds himself in a fierce battle against one of the vile creatures. However, with his newfound knowledge of magic, Yuya manages to survive the encounter. To his surprise, the girl he saved decides that eliminating Yuya should be her top priority. Meanwhile, Yuya finally reaches the capital to meet the king. Unfortunately, things don't go smoothly for Yuya as the king. Mistakenly believing that Yuya has won over his daughter, harbors resentment towards him. Before their meeting can progress any further, their gathering is abruptly disrupted by a group of assassins. Displaying his exceptional skills, Yuya effortlessly defeats the assailants. However, the discovery of a distinct emblem on one of the assassins reveals a shocking truth. Prince Riger, the king's own son, was behind the attack. If you've been following this thrilling series, remember to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss the highly anticipated final episode. News of the attack quickly spreads, causing unrest among the citizens. Rumors circulate that the king has secluded himself in his chamber. Yuya contemplates his next move amidst this turmoil. Meanwhile, Alan seeks Yuya's assistance in protecting Lexia, the princess. With a sense of hesitation, Yuya embarks on a search for Lexia. Eventually, they cross paths, and Lexia proposes exploring the capital together, considering it's Yuya's first time there. Luna, aware of the delicate circumstances, reminds Lexia of her safety. However, Lexia argues that if her brother were to send more assassins, it would inadvertently expose his own location. Luna acknowledges Lexia's reasoning but suspects her true motive is simply a desire to step outside. Luna suggests that Lexia should stay within the castle while she takes on the role of Yuya's guide. However, Lexia firmly declines, refusing to let them be alone together. Owen proposes the idea of showing Yuya around the castle, but both Luna and Lexia reject his suggestion. In the end, both girls decide to go with Yuya while Owen watches from a distance. As they explore the city, a commotion arises when Luna and Lexia begin fighting over Yuya's attention. The onlookers start to wonder if Yuya is of noble birth, as he is accompanied by two beautiful girls. During their city tour, Yuya expresses his interest in the Adventurer's Guild. He mentions his previous registration with the Merchant's Guild, which Luna suggests he should do for the Adventurer's Guild as well. Luna explains that registering with the guild will facilitate trading monster materials and taking on quests, providing Yuya with both convenience and an opportunity to earn some money. Excited by the prospect of going on a quest with Yuya, Luna decides to register as well. Lexia, however, is not pleased with the idea. Despite Lexia's complaints, Luna assures her that Yuya will likely be too occupied with quests to accompany her. Upon reaching the Adventurer's Guild, they meet the clerk named Emilia who hands them their application forms. Yuya starts filling out the form but encounters a question about his magical abilities. Remembering the sage's advice about magic knowledge being less advanced in this world, he decides to omit his ability to use all types of magic, including teleportation. Instead, he writes down wind, fire, and water as his elemental affinities. The next question pertains to magical power, and Emilia explains that they use a crystal ball to measure an individual's magical energy. Yuya wonders why they don't simply check their status windows, but Emilia clarifies that most adventurers keep their stats private to ensure no one is lying. Luna steps forward to have her energy measured, causing the ball to glow yellow. She modestly mentions that she has never been particularly skilled in magic. It's then Yuya's turn to measure his energy, but everyone is taken aback when the crystal ball shatters upon contact. Thinking it might be a mistake, Amelia decides to test him again, only to obtain the same result. Yuya apologizes and offers to pay for the damaged ball, but Amelia reassures him that it's not necessary. As Amelia reviews their applications, she becomes astounded upon reading that Yuya can use three different types of magic. Yuya's mind races with curiosity as Amelia describes the significance of his ability to use three types of magic. He begins to realize that he possesses powers beyond ordinary comprehension, something straight out of the fairy tales and legends of this world. Lexia, in awe of his abilities, finds Yuya truly remarkable. Deep down, Yuya is relieved that he didn't disclose the full extent of his magical repertoire. Emilia feeds their applications into a machine, and in a flourish of magic, their guild cards materialize before their eyes. As new adventurers, they are initially placed in the F rank. 
Yuya wonders if there are specific requirements for completing quests, to which Amelia reassures them that they have the freedom to progress at their own pace. However, she advises caution during item-gathering quests, urging them to avoid over-harvesting plants to allow for their regrowth. The group approaches the quest board, contemplating which task to undertake first, when suddenly a woman named Glenda approaches Yuya. She expresses her desire to team up with him. Having witnessed his remarkable feat of shattering the crystal ball during the magical energy measurement, Luna and Lexia, sensing trouble, attempt to pull Glenda away, insisting that she has had too much to drink. Glenda bids farewell, expressing her hopes of encountering Yuya again in the future. Lexia contemplates her decision to join the guild, considering the need to protect Yuya from other women. Luna counters her by reminding her of Ellen's struggles to control her own feelings. Determined, they venture into the field for their first quest, tasked with gathering herbs. Yuya surprises himself with his discernment skill, which aids him in effectively harvesting the herbs. Luna finds it challenging to gather the herbs without damaging their delicate roots, while Lexia savors the escape from their usual surroundings. Lexia proposes a friendly competition to Luna, suggesting that the one who collects the most valuable herbs gets to spend an entire day on a date with Yuya. Owen interjects, reminding them to avoid depleting the area through over-harvesting. With their agreement in place, they set off on their individual searches. Yuya finds himself alone, stumbling upon a miraculous mana healing plant. In contrast, Nakasuki, his faithful companion, unintentionally leads him to an extremely poisonous plant. As the girls return with their gathered herbs, Yuya inspects their finds. Suddenly, Owen rushes over, urgently seeking Yuya's assistance. He reveals that they have discovered the whereabouts of the elusive First Prince. Lexia and Luna, entrusted with returning to the castle, bid farewell to Yuya as he joins Owen on their journey. Their path takes them to an abandoned house, where an air of eerie silence lingers, foreshadowing the imminent twists and turns of their adventure. As they cautiously enter the house, a knife swiftly finds its mark, hitting one of the soldiers. They discover the prince holding a guard hostage, his blade poised dangerously close to the man's throat. In a remarkable display of skill, Yuya commands his faithful companion, Knight, to swiftly intervene, rescuing the imperiled guard. Alan and his forces surround the prince, demanding his surrender. Defiant and consumed by despair, the prince slashes at his captors, even contemplating ending his own life, believing himself to be worthless. Owen, at a loss for what to do, witnesses Yuya's lightning-quick response as he rushes forward to stop the prince's self-destructive intentions. Despite the prince's futile attempt to attack him, Yuya expertly knocks him to the ground. Owen expresses his profound gratitude to Yuya for his timely intervention, and they prepare to take the prince into custody. Suddenly, a thunderous explosion rips through the house, shattering the tension-filled atmosphere. To the prince's relief, the girl from the vile faction emerges from the chaos. Calm and calculating, she analyzes the situation and dismisses the prince, deeming him a failure and no longer necessary. Shocked and betrayed, the prince realizes that her true intentions were to exploit him, using him as a catalyst for war and mass bloodshed. He had naively believed she wanted to help him ascend to the throne, but her revelation exposes her sinister plan to bring destruction upon humanity. As the girl prepares to deliver the final blow, Owen desperately tries to save the prince but finds himself halted by an arrow. Yuya, curious about the arrow's origin, witnesses the girl bombarding them with a relentless barrage. Owen wonders about her true motives, and she chillingly unveils her intention to wipe out all of humanity. The knights find themselves locked in a desperate struggle against the girl's arrows, compounded by her ability to predict their every move. With the girl poised to deliver the finishing blow, Yuya harnesses his magic and unleashes a powerful gust, dispersing the onslaught of arrows. Owen expresses his deep gratitude to Yuya for saving them, while the girl realizes that Yuya is the union she seeks, her primary target. Weakened by her exertions, she decides to retreat for the time being. With the prince safely apprehended, Yuya is left pondering the enigmatic identity and motives of the girl. As the episode draws to a close, the lingering question of the girl's true intentions remains unanswered. The story unfolds as Yuya and his companions find themselves in the Grand Palace. Lexia, amazed by Yuya's strength, expresses her relief at his well-being. Just then, Owen arrives and informs them about an impending meeting to determine Prince Riger's fate. Owen insists that Yuya attends this crucial gathering. The scene transitions to the meeting chamber, where everyone convenes. The soldiers proceed to remove Riger's mask and unbutton his shirt, revealing his body covered in wounds. Observing the sympathy in Lexia's eyes, Riger wonders if she pities him. 
blaming Lexia for his current state. Ryger explains that he ended up like this due to her uncontrollable magical outbursts. King Arnold remarks that the injuries inflicted by Lexia should have already healed. Ryger clarifies that they did heal initially, but the overwhelming surge of Lexia's magic caused his body to spiral out of control. To regain some semblance of peace, he resorted to self-destruction. Ryger's present condition stands as a testament to his desperate struggle, leaving him questioning why his father did not offer any assistance. The king laments his inability to treat Ryger's affliction, leading Ryger to ponder if his father deliberately isolated him. The seclusion within the castle has fueled an insatiable desire within him to obliterate Lexia, as he believes no one comprehends the agony of being perceived as repulsive and unfit for public view. Ewer recognizes the similarities between Ryger's current state and his own past. He understands the inner turmoil Ryger experiences. Feeling that life holds no purpose for him anymore, Ryger pleads for them to end his suffering through death. Excitement filled the air as Ewer declared that he had an idea worth trying. With a determined expression, he produced a vial containing a potent healing potion. Curiosity swirled among the onlookers, wondering what Yuya had in mind. Without hesitation, Yuya urged Ryger to drink the healing potion. The others watched with bated breath, uncertain of the outcome. To their astonishment, the potion worked its magic, swiftly mending all of Ryger's wounds. Gasps of surprise echoed through the room, witnessing the miraculous transformation before their eyes. Ryger, captivated by his own reflection in a nearby mirror, marveled at his newfound wholeness. The once present scars and injuries had vanished completely. Perplexed by this unexpected turn of events, Yua confessed his lack of understanding. However, if the wounds were the root cause of Ryger's affliction, Yuya suggested that there might exist medicinal remedies capable of curing him. He divulged the existence of a miraculous herb known as the Cure-All Herb, leaving everyone astonished by the revelation. The soldiers quickly verified the authenticity of Yuya's claim, confirming the potency of the herb. Yuya, recalling the herb's description from his readings, admitted that it was considered a legendary plant. Overwhelmed by the realization, he reflected on the abundance of these remarkable herbs flourishing in his own backyard. Feeling remorseful, the king expressed his apologies to Yuya for utilizing such a precious item. Yuya reassured the king, stating that there was no need to worry as he possessed an ample supply in his garden. However, despite the healing of his physical wounds, Ryger remained despondent, believing that his fate still held a death sentence. Seeking clarity, Lexia addressed her father, inquiring about her brother's transgressions. The king somberly revealed that Ryger had attempted to take Lexia's life. In a surprising turn, Lexia chose to forgive Ryger for his actions, asserting that it was not as complicated as it seemed. She firmly believed that if the victim forgave him, there should be no further complications. The king, however, revealed that Ryger had also targeted him. Lexia, determined, implored her father to extend his forgiveness to Ryger, emphasizing that this act would ultimately resolve the situation at hand. Reluctant at first, the king, unable to resist his daughter's heartfelt plea, succumbs to Lexia's demands. Overwhelmed with emotion, Ryger is moved to tears upon hearing Lexia express her desire to reconcile with him. Grateful for all that Yuya has done, Ryger offers his sincere thanks, while the king redirects the conversation toward rewarding Yuya for his efforts. Lexia playfully suggests that Yuya's reward should be marrying her, prompting Luna to interject, claiming that Yuya should marry her instead. The two girls engage in a lighthearted argument, vying for Yuya's affections. Amidst the playful banter, Ryger presents an idea to the king. Acknowledging the proposal, the king declares that he will grant Yuya ownership of Ryger's mansion and lands bestowing upon him the esteemed title of Knight Baron. Pleased with the generous reward, Yuya accepts, his future taking an unexpected turn. Later, in the comfort of a room within the castle, Yuya decides to spend the night. Feeling the weight of the day's events, Yuya expresses his fatigue before drifting off to sleep. As slumber envelops him, Yuya finds himself immersed in a dream, reliving his battle with the enigmatic silver-haired girl. Abruptly, he awakens from his vivid reverie. The scene transitions to Yuya's school, where the day concludes, and his friends invite him to join them. However, Yuya declines their invitation, citing pressing matters that require his attention. Despite Kaori's attempt to dissuade him, Yuya hastily departs, his urgency palpable. On his journey, Yuya's thoughts gravitate to his conversation with Ryger regarding the silver-haired girl. Ryger had admitted knowing little about her, having encountered her solely through the Dark Guild, falling victim to her manipulative ways. Yuya recalls the girl's mention of the power of evil, paralleling the information imparted by the rabbit. The scene shifts to Yuya training fervently in the domain of the great demons, preparing himself for a future encounter with the girl, 
and the forces of evil she represents. Driven by the realization that the rabbit might hold knowledge crucial to her defeat, Yuya focuses on honing his skills and fortifying himself against the impending battle. Suddenly, the girl launches an unexpected attack, catching Yuya off guard. Perplexed, Yuya questions her motives, seeking to understand why she is targeting him. In response, the girl asserts that Yuya has become an obstacle to her plans, and she harbors a need for revenge. Swiftly, Yuya conceals Akatsuki, his weapon of choice, expressing his confusion regarding the girl's intentions. Determined to uncover the truth, Yuya resolves to defeat her first and then extract the details from her. Meanwhile, in the parallel world, Kaori stands outside Yuya's residence, ringing the doorbell to no avail. Alarmed by the open door, she steps inside, unwittingly entering the alternate realm. Anxious to find Yuya, she recalls his warning about the forest monsters and proceeds cautiously. In the distance, Kaori detects the echoes of a fierce battle. There, she witnesses Yuya engaged in combat with the silver-haired girl. Puzzled, Yuya questions what he has done to incur her wrath, but the girl dismisses his inquiry, launching another attack. Yuya skillfully evades her strikes, swiftly counterattacking with the aid of night. Impressed by Yuya's prowess, the girl recognizes the need to subdue him swiftly. Unrelenting, she continues her assault, only for Yuya to deftly evade once more. Just as the confrontation reaches a critical point, Kaori arrives on the scene, catching the attention of the girl. Seizing the opportunity, she attempts to strike Kaori, but Yuya valiantly steps in to shield his friend. Capitalizing on Yuya's distraction, the girl corners him. Yuya finds himself trapped, devoid of escape options. The girl prepares to deliver a final blow, but in the nick of time, the rabbit intervenes, calling out to Yuya. Revealing his findings, the rabbit addresses the girl by the name Yudi. Yudi expresses astonishment at the rabbit's knowledge of her identity. The rabbit surmises that she must be the successor of the slain divine archer. Yudi declares her intent to avenge her master and wreak vengeance upon the world. The rabbit contends that such actions contradict her master's wishes. He asserts that as divine beings, their duty is to protect the world from evil and that they mustn't violate their sacred contract or employ divine techniques to bring about its destruction. Unswayed by the rabbit's reasoning, Yudi dismisses his words, claiming that she merely inherited her master's skills, not his divine title. She launches an attack, leaving Yuya and the rabbit with no choice but to defend themselves. Yuya attempts to employ swift footwork, but Yudi anticipates his moves, striking him relentlessly. Thinking quickly, the rabbit instructs Yuya to replicate a previously successful maneuver. With newfound resolve, Yuya counters Yudi's assault. The opening created by Yuya's diversion allows Knight and the rabbit to deliver a powerful blow to Yudi. The rabbit emphasizes his commitment to protect the world as a divine being, while Yudi derides the worthlessness of those who killed her master, accusing humanity of perpetuating senseless conflicts. The rabbit counters that they do not possess the authority to determine one's worth. The battle rages on, as the fate of the world hangs in the balance. Determined to make a decisive judgment on humanity's worth, Yudi declares her intention to destroy them all, unleashing the power of evil. Recognizing the transformation in Yudi, the rabbit concludes that she has become a malevolent divine being and engages her in battle. Yuya watches in disbelief as Yudi matches the rabbit blow for blow, realizing the gravity of the situation. Just as hope wanes, Akatsuki emerges from the shadows, ready to join the fray. Utilizing his holy ground skill, Akatsuki nullifies Yudi's power of evil, rendering her defenseless. Yuya seizes the opportunity and defeats her. The rabbit elucidates the existence of other holy beings in the world, including Akatsuki, referring to him as one of them. Accepting the outcome, the rabbit entrusts Yudi's future to Yuya, knowing she can no longer harness the powers of evil. With his parting words, the rabbit departs. Awakening from her ordeal, Yudi is overcome with emotion. Yuya, curious about her master's true nature, inquires about his character. Tearfully, Yudi describes him as a compassionate individual brimming with love. At that moment, Kaori arrives, prompting Yuya to notice a monster lurking behind her. Swiftly, he employs his spear, eliminating the threat. Kaori, astounded by Yuya's display, witnesses a glimpse of his other life, where he effortlessly dispatches foes, even if they are monstrous. Tentatively, Yuya questions if Kaori is now afraid of him. Kaori vehemently denies any fear, assuring Yuya that nothing has changed since the day he first aided her. Their bond remains steadfast. The scene transitions to Kaori's encounter with Lexia and Luna, where the three girls forge a newfound friendship, sharing joyful moments, including bathing together. Furthermore, Yuya reconciles with his younger siblings, healing the fractures of the past. Meanwhile, Yudi joins Yuya's school as a new student, signifying a fresh start for her. 
Thus, the first season concludes, promising further adventures and developments in the future.